This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Larissa Jaworski, Brisbane, Australia, March 2007. Mansfield Park by Jane Austen. Chapter 35. Edmund had determined that it belonged entirely to Fanny to choose whether her situation with regard to Crawford should be mentioned between them or not, and that if she did not lead the way it should never be touched on by him. But after a day or two of mutual reserve he was induced by his father to change his mind and try what his influence might do for his friend. A day, and a very early day, was actually fixed for the Crawfords' departure, and Sir Thomas thought it might be as well to make one more effort for the young man before he left Mansfield, that all his professions and vows of unshaken attachment might have as much hope to sustain them as possible. Sir Thomas was most cordially anxious for the perfection of Mr. Crawford's character in that point. He wished him to be a model of constancy, and fancied the best means of effecting it would be by not trying him too long. Edmund was not unwilling to be persuaded to engage in the business. He wanted to know Fanny's feelings. She had been used to consult him in every difficulty, and he loved her too well to bear to be denied her confidence now. He hoped to be of service to her. He thought he must be of service to her. Whom else had she to open her heart to? If she did not need counsel, she must need the comfort of communication. Fanny estranged from him, silent and reserved, was an unnatural state of things, a state which he must break through and which he could easily learn to think she was wanting him to break through. "'I will speak to her, sir. I will take the first opportunity of speaking to her alone,' was the result of such thoughts as these, and upon Sir Thomas's information of her being at that very time walking alone in the shrubbery, he instantly joined her. "'I am come to walk with you, Fanny,' said he. "'Shall I?' drawing her arm within his. "'It's a long while since we've had a comfortable walk together.' She assented to it all, rather by look than word. Her spirits were low. "'But Fanny,' he presently added, "'in order to have a comfortable walk, "'something more is necessary than merely pacing this gravel together. "'You must talk to me.' I know you have something on your mind. I know what you are thinking of. You cannot suppose me uninformed. Am I to hear of it from everybody but Fanny herself? Fanny, at once agitated and dejected, replied, If you hear of it from everybody, cousin, there can be nothing for me to tell. Not of facts, perhaps, but of feelings, Fanny. No one but you can tell me them. I do not mean to press you, however. If it is not what you wish yourself, I have done... I have thought it might be a relief. I am afraid we think too differently for me to find any relief in talking of what I feel. Do you suppose that we think differently? I have had no idea of it. I dare say on a comparison of our opinions they would be found as much alike as they have been used to be. To the point, I consider Crawford's proposals as most advantageous and desirable. If you could return his affection, I consider it as most natural that all your family should wish you could return it, but that, as you cannot, you have done exactly as you ought in refusing him. Can there be any disagreement between us here? Oh, no, but I thought you blamed me. I thought you were against me. This is such comfort. This comfort you might have had sooner, Fanny, had you sought it. But how could you possibly suppose me against you? How could you imagine me as an advocate for marriage without love? Were I even careless in general on such matters, how could you imagine me so where your happiness was at stake? My uncle thought me wrong, and I knew he had been talking to you. As far as you have gone, Fanny, I think you perfectly right. I may be sorry, I may be surprised, though hardly that, for you had not time to attach yourself, but I think you perfectly right. Can it admit of a question... It is disgraceful to us if it does. You did not love him. Nothing could have justified your accepting him. Fanny had not felt so comfortable for days and days. So far your conduct has been faultless, and they were quite mistaken who wished you to do otherwise. But the matter does not end here. Crawford's is no common attachment. 
He perseveres with the hope of creating that regard which had not been created before. This, we know, must be a work of time. But, with an affectionate smile, let him succeed at last, Fanny, let him succeed at last. You have proved yourself upright and disinterested. Prove yourself grateful and tender-hearted, and then you will be the perfect model of a woman which I have always believed you born for. Oh, never, 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 he will never succeed with me, and she spoke with a warmth which quite astonished Edmund, and which she blushed at the recollection of herself when she saw his look, and heard him reply, Never, Fanny, so determined and positive, this is not like yourself, your rational self. I mean, she cried, sorrowfully correcting herself, that I think I shall, never shall, as far as the future can be answered for, I think I never shall return his regard. I must hope better things. I am aware more than Crawford can be, that the man who means to make you love him, and having due notice of his intentions, must have very uphill work, for there are all your early attachments and habits in battle array, and before he can get your heart for his own, own use, he has to unfasten it from all the holds upon things animate and inanimate, which so many years of growth have confirmed and which are considerably tightened for the moment by the very idea of separation. I know that the apprehension of being forced to quit Mansfield will, for a time, be arming you against him. I wish he had not been obliged to tell you what he was trying for. I wish he had known you as well as I do, Fanny. Between us, I think we should have won you. My theoretical and his practical knowledge together could not have failed. He should have worked upon my plans. I must hope, however, that time proving him, as I firmly believe it will, to deserve you by his steady affection, will give him his reward. I cannot suppose that you have not the wish to love him, the natural wish of gratitude. You must have some feeling of that sort. You must be sorry for your own indifference. We are so totally unalike, said Fanny, avoiding a direct answer. We are so very, very different in all our inclinations and ways that I consider it quite impossible we should ever be tolerably happy together, even if I could like him. There were never two people more dissimilar. We have not one taste in common. We should be miserable. You are mistaken, Fanny. The dissimilarity is not so strong. You are quite enough alike. You have tastes in common. You have moral and literary tastes in common. You have both warm hearts and benevolent feelings, and Fanny, who that heard him read and saw you listen to Shakespeare the other night, will think you unfitted as companions. You forget yourself. There is a decided difference in your tempers, I allow. He is lively, you are serious, but so much the better. His spirits will support yours. It is your disposition to be easily dejected, and to fancy difficulties greater than they are. His cheerfulness will counteract this. He sees difficulties nowhere, his, and his pleasantness and gaiety will be a constant support to you. Your being so far unlike Fanny does not in the smallest degree make against the probability of your happiness together. Do not imagine it. I am myself convinced that it is rather a favourable circumstance. I am perfectly persuaded that the tempers had better be unlike. I mean unlike in the flow of spirits in the manners, in the inclination for much or little company in the prosperity to talk or be silent, to be grave or to be gay, some opposition here is, I am thoroughly convinced, friendly to matrimonial happiness. I exclude extremes, of course, and a very close resemblance in all those points would be the likeliest way to produce an extreme. A counteraction, gentle and continual, is the best safeguard of manners and conduct." Full well could Fanny guess where his thoughts were now. Miss Crawford's power was all returning. He had been speaking of her cheerfully from the hour of his coming home. His avoiding her was quite at an end. He had dined at the parsonage only the preceding day. After leaving him to his happier thoughts for some minutes, Fanny, feeling it due to herself, returned to Mr. Crawford and said, it is not merely in temper that I consider him as totally unsuited to myself, though in that respect I think the differences between us too great, infinitely too great. His spirits often oppress me. But there is something in him which I object to still more. I must say, cousin, that I cannot approve his character. I have not thought well of him from the time of the play. I then saw him behaving, as it appeared to me, so very improperly and unfeelingly, 
I may speak of it now because it's all over, so improperly by poor Mr. Rushworth, not seeming to care how he exposed or hurt him, and paying attentions to my cousin Maria, which in short, at the time of the play I received, is an impression which will never be got over. My dear Fanny, replied Edmund, scarcely hearing her to the end, let us not any of us be judged by what we appeared at that period of general folly. The time of the play is a time which I hate to recollect. Maria was wrong, Crawford was wrong, we were all wrong together, but none so wrong as myself. Compared with me, all the rest were blameless. I was playing the fool with my eyes open. As a bystander, said Fanny, perhaps I saw more than you did. I did think that Mr. Rushworth was sometimes very jealous. Very possibly. No wonder nothing could be more improper than the whole business. I am shocked whenever I think that Maria could be capable of it, but if she could undertake the part, we must not be surprised at the rest. Before the play, I am very much mistaken if Julia did not think he was paying her attentions. Julia? I have heard before from someone of his being in love with Julia, but I could never see anything of it. And, Fanny, I, though I hope I do justice to my sister's good qualities, I think it very possible that they might, one or both, be more desirous of being admired by Crawford, and might show that desire rather more unguardedly than was perfectly prudent. I can remember that they were evidently fond of his society, and, with such encouragement, a man like Crawford, lively, and it may be a little unthinking, might be led on to, there could be nothing more striking, because it is clear that he had no pretensions, his heart was reserved for you. And I must say that its being for you has raised him inconceivably, in my opinion. It does him the highest honour. It shows his proper estimation of the blessings of domestic happiness and pure attachment. It proves him unspoiled by his uncle. It proves him, in short, everything that I had used to wish to believe him, and feared he was not. I am persuaded that he does not think as he ought on serious subjects. Say, rather, that he has not thought at all upon serious subjects, which I believe to be a good deal the case. How could it be otherwise, with such an education and adviser, under the disadvantages indeed which both have had? Is it not wonderful that they should be what they are? Crawford's feelings, I am ready to acknowledge, have hitherto been too much his guides. Happily, those feelings have generally been good. You will supply the rest, and a most fortunate man he is to attach himself to such a creature, to a woman who, firm as a rock in her own principles, has a gentleness of character so well adapted to recommend them. He has chosen his partner, indeed, with rare felicity. He will make you happy, Fanny. I know he will make you happy, but you will make him everything. I would not engage in such a charge, cried Fanny, in a shrieking accent, in such an office of high responsibility. As usual, believing yourself unequal to anything, fancying everything too much for you. Well, I thought I might not be able to persuade you into different feelings. You will be persuaded into them. I trust, I confess myself sincerely anxious that you may. I have no common interest in Crawford's well-doing. Next to your happiness, Fanny, his has the first claim on me. You are aware of my having no common interest in Crawford. Fanny was too well aware of it to have anything to say, and they walked on together some fifty yards in mutual silence and abstraction. Edmund first began again. I was very much pleased by her manner of speaking of it yesterday, particularly pleased, because I had not depended upon her seeing everything in so just a light. I knew she was very fond of you, but uh, yet I was afraid of her not estimating your worth to her brother quite as it deserved, and of her regretting that she had not rather fixed on some woman of distinction or fortune. I was afraid of the bias of those worldly maxims which she has been too much used to hear, but it was very different. She spoke of you, Fanny, just as she ought. She desires the connection as warmly as your uncle or myself. We had a long talk about it. I should not have mentioned the subject, though very anxious to know her sentiments. 
but I had not been in the room five minutes before she began introducing it with all the openness of heart and sweet peculiarity of manner, that spirit and ingenuousness which are so much a part of herself. Mrs. Grant laughed at her for her rapidity. Was Mrs. Grant in the room then? Yes. When I reached the house I found the two sisters together by themselves. And when once we had begun we had not done with you, Fanny, till Crawford and Dr. Grant came in. It is above a week since I saw Miss Crawford. Yes, she laments it, yet owns it may have been the best. You will see her, however, before she goes. She is very angry with you, Fanny. You must be prepared for that. She calls herself very angry, but you can imagine her anger. It is regret and disappointment of a sister who thinks that her brother has a right to everything he may wish for at the first moment. She is hurt, as you would be for William, but she loves and esteems you with all her heart. I knew she would be very angry with me. My dearest Fanny, cried Edmund, pressing her arm closer to him, do not let the idea of her anger distress you. It is an anger to be talked of rather than felt. Her heart is made for love and kindness, not for resentment. I wish you could have overheard her tribute of praise. I wish you could have seen her countenance when she said that you should be Henry's wife. And I observed that she always spoke of you as Fanny, which she was never used to do, and it had a sound of most sisterly cordiality. And Mrs. Grant, did she say, did she speak? Was she there all the time? Yes, she was agreeing exactly with her sister. The surprise of your refusal, Fanny, seems to have been unbounded. That you could refuse such a man as Henry Crawford seems more than they can understand. I said what I could for you, but in good truth, as they stated the case, you must prove yourself to be in your senses as soon as you can by a different conduct. Nothing else will satisfy them. But this is teasing you. I have done. Do not turn away from me. I should have thought, said Fanny, after a pause of recollection and exertion, that every woman must have felt the possibility of a man's not being approved, not being loved by some one of her sex at least. Let him ever be so generally agreeable. Let him have all the perfections in the world. I, th I think it ought not to be set down as certain that a man must be acceptable to every woman he may happen to like himself. But even supposing it is so, allowing Mr. Crawford to have all the claims which his sisters think he has, how was I to be prepared to meet him with any feelings answerable to his own? He took me wholly by surprise. I had not an idea that his behaviour to me had before had had any meaning. And surely I was not to be teaching myself to like him only because he was taking what seemed a very idle notice of me. In my situation it would have been the extreme of vanity to be forming expectations on Mr. Crawford. I am sure his sisters, rating him as they do, must have thought it so. Supposing he had meant nothing, how then was I to be to be in love with him the moment he said he was with me? How was I to have an attachment at his service as soon as it was asked for? His sisters should consider me as well as him. The higher his deserts, the more improper for me to have ever thought of him. And we think very differently of the nature of women. If they can imagine a woman so very soon capable of returning an affection as this seems to imply. My dear Fanny, now I have the truth. I know this to be the truth and most worthy of you are such feelings. I had attributed them to you before. I thought I could understand you. You have now given exactly the explanation which I ventured to make for you to your friend and Mrs. Grant, and they were both better satisfied, though your warm-hearted friend was still run away with a little by the enthusiasm of her fondness for Henry. I told them that you were of all human creatures the one over whom habit had the most power and novelty the least, and that the very circumstance of the novelty of Crawford's addresses was against him. Their being so new and so recent was all in their disfavour, that you could tolerate nothing that you were not used to, and a great deal more to the same purpose, to give them knowledge of your character. Miss Crawford made us laugh by her plans of encouragement for her brother. She meant to urge him to persevere in the hope of being loved in time, and of having his addresses most kindly received at the end of about ten years' happy marriage. 
Fanny could with difficulty give the smile that was here asked for. Her feelings were all in revolt. She feared she had been doing wrong, saying too much, overacting the caution which she had been fancying necessary. In guarding against one evil, laying herself open to another, and to have Miss Crawford's liveliness repeated to her at such a moment, and on such a subject, was bitter aggravation. Edmund saw weariness and distress in her face, and immediately resolved to forbear all further discussion, and not even to mention the name of Crawford again, except as it might be connected with what must be agreeable to her. On this principle, he soon afterwards observed, "'They go on Monday. You are sure, therefore, of seeing your friend either to-morrow or Sunday. They really go Monday, and I was within a trifle of being persuaded to stay at Lessingby till that very day.' I had almost promised it. What a difference it might have made. Those five or six days more at Lessingby might have been felt all my life. You were near staying there? Very. I was most kindly pressed and had nearly consented. Had I received any letter from Mansfield to tell me how you were all going, I believe I should certainly have stayed. But I knew nothing that had happened here for a fortnight and felt that I had been away long enough. You spent your time pleasantly there? Yes, that is, it was the fault of my own mind if I did not. They were all very pleasant. I doubt their finding me so. I took uneasiness with me, and there was no getting rid of it till I was in Mansfield again. The Miss Owens, you liked them, did not you? Yes, very well. Pleasant, good-humoured, unaffected girls. But I am spoilt, Fanny, for common female society— Good-humoured, unaffected girls will not do for a man who has been used to sensible women. They are two distinct orders of being. You and Miss Crawford have made me too nice. Still, however, Fanny was oppressed and wearied. He saw it in her looks. It could not be talked away, and attempting it no more, he led her directly, with the kind authority of a privileged guardian, into the house. End of chapter 35 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gemma Blythe of Mansfield Park by Jane Austen. Chapter 36 Edmund now believed himself perfectly acquainted with all that Fanny could tell or could leave to be conjectured of her sentiments. And he was satisfied. It had been, as he before presumed, too hasty a measure on Crawford's side, and time must be given to make the idea first familiar and then agreeable to her. She must be used to the consideration of his being in love with her, and then a return of affection might not be very distant. He gave this opinion as the result of the conversation to his father, and recommended there being nothing more said to her, no further attempts to influence or persuade, but that everything should be left to Crawford's assiduities and the natural workings of her own mind. Sir Thomas promised that it should be so, Edmund's account of Fanny's disposition he could believe to be just. He supposed she had all those feelings, but he must consider it as very unfortunate that she had. For, less willing than his son to trust to the future, he could not help fearing that if such very long allowances of time and habit were necessary for her, she might not have persuaded herself into receiving his addresses properly before the young man's inclination for paying them were over. There was nothing to be done, however, but to submit quietly and hope the best. The promised visit from her friend, as Edmund called Miss Crawford, was a formidable threat to Fanny, and she lived in continual terror of it. As a sister, so partial and so angry, and so little scrupulous of what she said, and in another light so triumphant and secure, 
She was in every way an object of painful alarm. Her displeasure, her penetration, and her happiness were all fearful to encounter, and the dependence of having others present when they met was Fanny's only support in looking forward to it. She absented herself as little as possible from Lady Bertram, kept away from the East Room, and took no solitary walk in the shrubbery in her caution to avoid any sudden attack. She succeeded. She was safe in the breakfast room with her aunt when Miss Crawford did come and the first misery over, and Miss Crawford looking and speaking with much less particularity of expression than she had anticipated. Fanny began to hope there would be nothing worse to be endured than the half-hour of moderate agitation. But here she hoped too much. Miss Crawford was not the slave of opportunity. She was determined to see Fanny alone, and therefore said to her, tolerably soon, in a low voice, I must speak to you for a few minutes somewhere, words that Fanny felt all over her, in all her pulses and all her nerves. Denial was impossible. Her habits of ready submission, on the contrary, made her almost instantly rise and lead the way out of the room. She did it with wretched feelings, but it was inevitable. They were no sooner in the hall than all restraint of countenance was over on Miss Crawford's side. She immediately shook her head at Fanny with arch yet affectionate reproach, and taking her hand, seemed hardly able to help beginning directly. She said nothing, however, but, Sad, sad girl, I do not know when I shall have done scolding you, and had discretion enough to reserve the rest till they might be secure of having four walls to themselves. Fanny, naturally, turned upstairs, and took her guest to the apartment, which was now always fit for comfortable use. Opening the door, however, with a most aching heart, and feeling that she had a more distressing scene before her than ever that spot had yet witnessed. But the evil ready to burst on her was at least delayed by the sudden change of Miss Crawford's ideas, by the strong effect on her mind, which the finding herself in the East Room again produced. Ha! she cried with instant animation. Am I here again? The East Room! Once only was I in this room before, and after stopping to look about her, and seemingly to retrace all that she had then passed, she added, Once only before. Do you remember it? I came to rehearse. Your cousin came too, and we had a rehearsal. You were our audience, and prompter. A delightful rehearsal. I shall never forget it. Here we were just in this part of the room. Here was your cousin, here was I, here were the chairs. Oh, why will such things ever pass away? Happily for her companion, she wanted no answer. Her mind was entirely self-engrossed. She was in a reverie of sweet remembrances. The scene we were rehearsing was so very remarkable. The subject of it so very, very, what shall I say? He was to be describing and recommending matrimony to me. I think I see him now, trying to be as demure and composed as Annald ought, through the two long speeches. When two sympathetic hearts meet in the marriage state, matrimony may be called a happy life. I suppose... No time can ever wear out the impression I have of his looks and voice as he said those words. It was curious, very curious, that we should have such a scene to play. If I had the power of recalling any one week of my existence, it should be that week, that acting week. Say what you would, Fanny, it should be that for I never knew such exquisite happiness in any other. His sturdy spirit, to bend as it did. Oh, it was sweet beyond expression, 
But alas, that very evening destroyed it all. That very evening brought your most unwelcome uncle. Poor Sir Thomas, who was glad to see you. Yet, Fanny, do not imagine I would now speak disrespectfully of Sir Thomas, though I certainly did hate him for many a week. No, I do him justice now. He is just what the head of such a family should be. Nay, in sober sadness, I believe I now love you all. And having said so, with a degree of tenderness and consciousness, which Fanny had never seen in her before, and now thought only too becoming, she turned away for a moment to recover herself. I have had a little fit since I came into this room, as you may perceive, said she presently, with a playful smile. But it is over now, so let us sit down and be comfortable. For as to scolding you, Fanny, which I came fully intending to do, I have not the heart for it when it comes to the point. And embracing her very affectionately, good, gentle Fanny, when I think of this being the last time of seeing you, for I don't know how long, I feel it quite impossible to do anything but love you. Fanny was affected. She had not foreseen anything of this, and her feelings could seldom withhold the melancholy influence of the word last. She cried, as if she had loved Miss Crawford more than she possibly could. And Miss Crawford, yet further softened by the sight of such emotion, hung about her with fondness, and said, I hate to leave you. I shall see no one half so amiable where I am going. Who says we shall not be sisters? I know we shall. I feel that we are born to be connected, and those tears convince me that you feel it too, dear Fanny. Fanny roused herself, and replying only in part, said, But you are only going from one set of friends to another. You are going to a very particular friend. Yes, very true. Mrs. Fraser has been my intimate friend for years, but I have not the least inclination to go near her. I can think only of the friends I am leaving, my excellent sister, yourself, and the Bertrams in general. You have all so much more heart among you than one finds in the world at large. You all give me a feeling of being able to trust and confide in you, which in common intercourse one knows nothing of. I wish I had settled with Mrs. Fraser, not to go to her till after Easter. A much better time for the visit, but now I cannot put her off. And when I have done with her, I must go to her sister, Lady Stornoway. Because she was rather my most particular friend of the two, but I have not cared much for her these three years. After this speech, the two girls sat many minutes silent, each thoughtful, Fanny meditating on the different sorts of friendship in the world. Mary on something of less philosophic tendency. She first spoke again. How perfectly I remember my resolving to look for you upstairs and setting off to find my way to the East Room without having any idea whereabouts it was. How well I remember what I was thinking of as I came along and my looking in and seeing you here sitting at this table at work and then your cousin's astonishment when he opened the door at seeing me here. To be sure, your uncle's returning that very evening. There never was anything quite like it. Another short fit of abstraction followed. When shaking it off, she thus attacked her companion. Why, Fanny, you are absolutely in a reverie, thinking, I hope, of one who is always thinking of you, Oh, that I could transport you for a short time into our circle in town, that you might understand how your power over Henry is thought of there. Oh, the envyings and heart-burnings of dozens and dozens, the wonder, the incredulity that will be felt at hearing what you have done. For as to secrecy, Henry is quite the hero of an old romance and glories in his chains. 
You should come to London to know how to estimate your conquest. If you were to see how he is courted, and how I am courted for his sake. Now I am well aware that I shall not be half so welcome to Mrs. Fraser in consequence of his situation with you. When she comes to know the truth, she will very likely wish me in North Hampshire again, for there is a daughter of Mr. Fraser, by a first wife, whom she is wild to get married and wants Henry to take. Oh, she has been trying for him, to such a degree. Innocent and quiet as you sit here, you cannot have an idea of the sensation that you will be occasioning, of the curiosity there will be to see you, of the endless questions I shall have to answer. Poor Margaret Fraser will be at me for ever about your eyes and your teeth and how you do your hair and who makes your shoes. I wish Margaret were married, for my poor friend's sake, for I look upon the Frasers to be about as unhappy as most other married people. And yet it was a most desirable match for Janet at the time. We were all delighted. She could not do otherwise than accept him, for he was rich and she had nothing. But he turns out ill-tempered and exigent, and wants a young woman, a beautiful young woman of five and twenty, to be as steady as himself. And my friend does not manage him well. She does not seem to know how to make the best of it. There is a spirit of irritation which, to say nothing worse, is certainly very ill-bred. In their house I shall call to mind the conjugal manners of Mansfield Parsonage, with respect. Even Dr. Grant does show a thorough confidence in my sister, and a certain consideration for her judgment, which makes one feel there is attachment. But of that I shall see nothing with the Frasers. I shall be at Mansfield for ever, Fanny. My own sister as a wife, Sir Thomas Bertram as a husband, are my standards of perfection. Poor Janet has been sadly taken in, and yet there was nothing improper on her side. She did not run into the match inconsiderately. There was no want of foresight. She took three days to consider of his proposals, and during those three days asked the advice of everybody connected with her whose opinion was worth having, and especially applied to my late dear aunt, whose knowledge of the world made her judgment very generally and deservedly looked up to by all the young people of her acquaintance, and she was decidedly in favor of Mr. Fraser. This seems as if nothing were a security for matrimonial comfort. I have not so much to say for my friend Flora, who jilted a very nice young man in the blues for the sake of that horrid Lord Stornoway, who has about as much sense, Fanny, as Mr. Rushworth, but much worse looking and with a blackguard character. I had my doubts at the time about her being right, for he has not even the air of a gentleman, and now I am sure she was wrong. By the by, Flora Ross was dying for Henry the first winter she came out. But were I to attempt to tell you of all the women whom I have known to be in love with him, I should never have done. It is you, only you, insensible Fanny, who can think of him with anything like indifference. But are you so insensible as to profess yourself? No, no, I see you are not. There was, indeed, so deep a blush over Fanny's face at that moment, as might warrant strong suspicion of a predisposed mind. Excellent creature, I will not tease you. Everything shall take its course. But, dear Fanny, you must allow that you were not so absolutely unprepared to have the question asked as your cousin fancies. It is not possible that you must have had some thoughts on the subject, some surmises as to what might be. He must have seen that he was trying to please you by every attention in his power. Was not he devoted to you at the ball? And then before the ball, the necklace. Oh, you received it just as it was meant. You were as conscious as heart could desire. I remember it perfectly. 
Do you mean, then, that your brother knew of the necklace beforehand? Oh, Miss Crawford, that was not fair. Knew of it. It was his own doing entirely, his own thought. I am ashamed to say that it had never entered my head, but I was delighted to act on his proposal for both your sakes. I will not say, replied Fanny, that I was not half afraid at the time of its being so, for there was something in your look that frightened me, but not at first. I was as unsuspicious of it at first. Indeed, indeed I was. It is as true as that I sit here, and had I had an idea of it, nothing should have induced me to accept the necklace. As to your brother's behavior, certainly I was sensible of a particularity. I had been sensible of it some little time, perhaps two or three weeks, but then I considered it as meaning nothing. I put it down as simply being his way and was as far from supposing as from wishing him to have any serious thoughts of me. I had not, Miss Crawford, been an inattentive observer of what was passing between him and some part of his family in the summer and autumn. I was quiet, but I was not blind. I could not but see that Mr. Crawford allowed himself in gallantries, which did mean nothing. Ah, I cannot deny it. He has now and then been a sad flirt, and cared very little for the havoc he might be making in young ladies' affections. I have often scolded him for it, but it is his only fault. And there is this to be said, that very few young ladies have any affections worth caring for. And then, Fanny, the glory of fixing one who has been shot at by so many of having it in one's power to pay off the debts of one's sex. Oh, I am sure it is not in woman's nature to refuse such a triumph. Fanny shook her head. I cannot think well of a man who sports with any woman's feelings, and there may often be a great deal more suffered than a stander-by can judge of. I do not defend him. I leave him entirely to your mercy, and when he has got you at Everingham, I do not care how much you lecture him, but this I will say, that his fault, the liking to make girls a little in love with him, is not half so dangerous to a wife's happiness as a tendency to fall in love himself, which he has never been addicted to. And I do seriously and truly believe that he is attached to you in a way that he never was to any woman before that he loves you with all his heart and will love you as nearly forever as possible. If any man ever loved a woman forever, I think Henry will do as much for you. Fanny could not avoid a faint smile, but had nothing to say. I cannot imagine Henry ever to have been happier, continued Mary presently, than when he had succeeded in getting your brother's commission. She had made a sure push at Fanny's feelings here. Oh, yes, how very, very kind of him. I know he must have exerted himself very much, for I know the parties he, he had to move. The Admiral hates trouble and scorns asking favors, and there are so many young men's claims to be attended to in the same way that a friendship and energy, not very determined, is easily put by. What a happy creature William must be! I wish I could see him. Poor Fanny's mind was thrown into the most distressing of all its varieties. The recollection of what had been done for William was always the most powerful disturber of every decision against Mr. Crawford, and she sat thinking deeply of it till Mary who had been first watching her complacently and then musing on something else, suddenly called her attention by saying, I should like to sit talking with you here all day, but we must not forget the ladies below, and so good-bye. My dear, my amiable, my excellent Fanny, 
for though we shall nominally part in the breakfast parlor, I must take leave of you here, and I do take leave, longing for a happy reunion, and trusting that when we meet again, it will be under circumstances which may open our hearts to each other, without any remnant or shadow of reserve. A very, very kind embrace, and some agitation of manner, accompanied these words. I shall see your cousin in town soon. He talks of being there tolerably soon. And Sir Thomas, I dare say, in the course of the spring, and your eldest cousin, and the Rushworths, and Julia, I am sure of meeting again and again, and all but you. I have two favors to ask. Fanny, one is your correspondence. You must write to me. And the other, that you will often call on Mrs. Grant and make her amends for my being gone. The first, at least, of these favors Fanny would rather not have been asked, but it was impossible for her to refuse the correspondence. It was impossible for her even not to accede to it more readily than her own judgment authorized. There was no resisting so much apparent affection. Her disposition was peculiarly calculated to value a fond treatment, and from having hitherto known so little of it, she was the more overcome by Miss Crawford. Besides, there was gratitude towards her for having made their tete-a-tete -tete so much less painful than her fears had predicted. It was over and she had escaped without reproaches and without detection. Her secret was still her own, and while that was the case, she thought she could resign herself to almost everything. In the evening there was another parting. Henry Crawford came and sat some time with them, and her spirits not being previously in the strongest state, her heart was softened for a while towards him, because he really seemed to feel... Quite unlike his usual self, he scarcely said anything. He was evidently oppressed, and Fanny must grieve for him, though hoping she might never see him again till he were the husband of some other woman. When it came to the moment of parting, he would take her hand. He would not be denied it. He said nothing, however, or nothing that she heard, and when he had left the room, she was at her pleased that such a token of friendship had passed. On the morrow, the Crawfords were gone. End of chapter 36 LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gemma Blythe of Mansfield Park by Jane Austen Chapter 37 Mr. Crawford gone, Sir Thomas's next object was that he should be missed, and he entertained great hope that his niece would find a blank in the loss of those attentions which at the time she had felt, or fancied, an evil. She had tasted of consequence in its most flattering form, and he did hope that the loss of it, the sinking again into nothing, would awaken very wholesome regrets in her mind. He watched her with this idea, and he could hardly tell with what success. He hardly knew whether there were any difference in her spirits or not. She was always so gentle and retiring that her emotions were beyond his discrimination. He did not understand her. He felt that he did not, and therefore applied to Edmund to tell him how she stood affected on the present occasion, and whether she were more or less happy than she had been. Edmund did not discern any symptoms of regret, and thought his father a little unreasonable in supposing the first three or four days could produce any. What chiefly surprised Edmund was that Crawford's sister, the friend and companion who had been so much to her, should not be more visibly regretted. He wondered that Fanny spoke so seldom of her, 
and had so little voluntarily to say of her concern at this separation. Alas, it was this sister, this friend and companion, who was now the chief bane of Fanny's comfort. If she could have believed Mary's future fate as unconnected with Mansfield, as she was determined the brothers should be, if she could have hoped her return to be as distant as she was as much inclined to think his, she would have been light of heart indeed. But the more she recollected and observed, the more deeply she was convinced that everything was now in a fairer train for Miss Crawford's marrying Edmund than it had ever been before. On his side the inclination was stronger, on her less equivocal. His objections, the scruples of his integrity, seemed all done away, nobody could tell how, and the doubts and hesitations of her ambition were equally got over, and equally, without apparent reason. It could only be imputed to increasing attachment. His good and her bad feelings yielded to love, and such love must unite them. He was to go to town as soon as some business relative to Thornton Lacey were completed, perhaps within a fortnight. He talked of going, he loved to talk of it, and when once with her again, Fanny could not doubt the rest. Her acceptance must be as certain as his offer, and yet there were bad feelings still remaining which made the prospect of it most sorrowful to her, independently, she believed, independently of self. In their very last conversation, Miss Crawford, in spite of some amiable sensations and much personal kindness, had still been Miss Crawford, still shewn a mind led astray and bewildered, and without any suspicion of being so, darkened, yet fancying itself light. She might love, but she did not deserve Edmund by any other sentiment. Fanny believed there was scarcely a second feeling in common between them, and she may be forgiven by older sages for looking on the chance of Miss Crawford's future improvement as nearly desperate, for thinking that if Edmund's influence in this season of love had already done so little in clearing her judgment and regulating her notions. His worth would be finally wasted on her even in years of matrimony. Experience might have hoped more for any young people so circumstanced, and impartiality would not have denied to Miss Crawford's nature that participation of the general nature of women which would lead her to adopt the opinions of the man she loved and respected as her own. But as such were Fanny's persuasions, she suffered very much from them, and could never speak of Miss Crawford without pain. Sir Thomas, meanwhile, went on with his own hopes and his own observations, still feeling a right, by all his knowledge of human nature, to expect to see the effect of the loss and power and consequence of his niece's spirits, and the past attention of the lover producing a craving for their return. And he was soon afterwards able to account for his not yet completely and indubitably seeing all this, by the prospect of another visitor, whose approach he could allow to be quite enough to support the spirits he was watching. William had obtained a ten days' leave of absence to be given to Northampshire, and was coming the happiest of lieutenants, because the latest maid to shew his happiness and describe his uniform. He came, and he would have been delighted to shew his uniform there, too, but not cruel custom prohibited its appearance except on duty. So the uniform remained at Portsmouth, and Edmund conjectured that before Fanny had any chance of seeing it, all its own freshness and all the freshness of its wearer's feelings must be worn away. It would be sunk into a badge of disgrace. For what can be more unbecoming or more worthless than the uniform of a lieutenant who has been a lieutenant a year or two and sees others made commanders before him? So reasoned Edmund. 
till his father made him the confidant of a scheme which placed Fanny's chance of seeing the second lieutenant of H.M.S. Thrush in all his glory in another light. This scheme was that she should accompany her brother back to Portsmouth and spend a little time with her own family. It had occurred to Sir Thomas in one of his dignified musings as a right and desirable measure, but before he absolutely made up his mind, he consulted his son. Edmund considered it every way and saw nothing but what was right. The thing was good in itself and could not be done at a better time, and he had no doubt of it being highly agreeable to Fanny. This was enough to determine Sir Thomas and a decisive, then so it shall be, closed that stage of the business. Sir Thomas retiring from it with some feelings of satisfaction, and views of good over and above what he had communicated to his son. For his prime motive in sending her away had very little to do with the propriety of her seeing her parents again, and nothing at all with the idea of making her happy. He certainly wished her to go willingly, but he as certainly wished her to be heartily sick of home before her visit ended and that a little abstinence from the elegancies and luxuries of Mansfield Park would bring her mind into a sober state, and incline her to a juster estimate of the value of that home of greater permanence and equal comfort of which she had the offer. It was a medicinal project upon his niece's understanding, which he must consider as at present diseased, a residence of eight or nine years in the abode of wealth and plenty, had a little disordered her powers of comparing and judging. Her father's house would, in all probability, teach her the value of a good income, and he trusted that she would be the wiser and happier woman all her life for the experiment he had devised. Had Fanny been at all addicted to raptures, she must have had a strong attack of them, when she first understood what was intended. When her uncle first made her the offer of visiting the parents and brothers and sisters, from whom she had been divided almost half her life, of returning for a couple of months to the scenes of her infancy, with William for the protector and companion of her journey, and the certainty of continuing to see William to the last hour of his remaining on land, had she ever given way to bursts of delight, it must have been then, for she was delighted, but her happiness was of a quiet, deep, heart-swelling sort, and though never a great talker, she was always more inclined to silence when feeling most strongly. At the moment, she could only thank and accept. Afterwards, when familiarized with the visions of enjoyment so suddenly opened, she could speak more largely to William and Edmund of what she felt, but still there were emotions of tenderness that could not be clothed in words. The remembrance of all her earliest pleasures, and of what she had suffered in being torn from them, came over her with renewed strength, and it seemed as if to be at home again, would heal every pain that had since grown out of the separation. To be in the center of such a circle, loved by so many and more loved by all than she had ever been before. To feel affection without fear or restraint. To feel herself the equal of those who surrounded her. To be at peace from all mention of the Crawfords, save from every look which could be fancied a reproach on their account. This was a prospect to be dwelt on with a fondness that could be but half acknowledged. Edmund, too, to be two months from him, and perhaps she might have allowed to make her absence three, must do her kind. At a distance, unassailed by his looks or his kindness and safe from the perpetual irritation of knowing his heart and striving to avoid his confidence, she should be able to reason herself into a proper state. 
she should be able to think of him as in london and arranging everything there without wretchedness what might have been hard to bear at mansfield was to become a slight evil at portsmouth the only drawback was the doubt of her aunt bertram's being comfortable without her she was of use to no one else but there she might be missed to a degree that she did not like to think of and that part of the arrangement was indeed the hardest for sir thomas to accomplish and what only he could have accomplished at all but he was master of mansfield park when he had really resolved on any measure he could always carry it through, and now, by dint of long talking on the subject, explaining and dwelling on the duty of Fanny's sometimes seeing her family, he did induce his wife to let her go, obtaining it rather from submission, however, than conviction, for Lady Bertram was convinced of very little more than that Sir Thomas thought Fanny ought to go, and therefore that she must in the calmness of her own dressing-room, in the impartial flow of her own meditations, unbiased by his bewildering statements. She could not acknowledge any necessity for Fanny's ever going near a mother and father who had done without her so long, while she was so useful to herself. And as to the not missing her, which under Mrs. Norris's discussion was the point attempted to be proved, she set herself very steadily against admitting any such thing. Sir Thomas had appealed to her reason, conscience, and dignity. He called it a sacrifice, and demanded it of her goodness and self-command as such. But Mrs. Norris wanted to persuade her that Fanny could be very well spared, she being ready to give up all her own time to her as requested, and, in short, could not really be wanted or missed. That may be, sister, was all Lady Bertram's reply. I dare say you are very right, but I am sure I shall miss her very much. The next step was to communicate with Portsmouth. Fanny wrote to offer herself, and her mother's answer, though short, was so kind, a few simple lines expressed so natural, and motherly a joy in the prospect of seeing her child again, as to confirm all the daughter's views of happiness in being with her. When she saw Sir Thomas actually give William notes for the purpose, she was struck with the idea of there being room for a third in the carriage, and suddenly seized with a strong inclination to go with them, to go and see her poor dear sister Price. She proclaimed her thoughts. She must say that she had more than half a mind to go with the young people, it would be such an indulgence to her. She had not seen her poor dear sister Price for more than twenty years, and it would be a help to the young people in their journey to have an older head to manage for them. And she could not help thinking her poor dear sister Price would feel it very unkind of her not to come by such an opportunity. William and Fanny were horror-struck at the idea. All the comfort of their comfortable journey would be destroyed at once. With woeful countenances, they looked at each other. Their suspense lasted an hour or two. No one interfered to encourage or dissuade. Mrs. Norris was left to settle the matter by herself, and it ended, to the infinite joy of her nephew and niece, in the recollection that she could not possibly be spared from Mansfield Park at present that she was a great deal too necessary to Sir Thomas and Lady Bertram for her to be able to answer it to herself, to leave them even for a week, and therefore must certainly sacrifice every other pleasure to that of being useful to them. It had, in fact, occurred to her that though taken to Portsmouth for nothing, it would be hardly possible for her to avoid paying her own expenses back again. So her dear poor sister Price was left to all the disappointment of her missing such an opportunity and another twenty years' absence, perhaps, begun. Edmund's plans were affected by this Portsmouth journey, this absence of Fanny's. He, too, had a sacrifice to make to Mansfield Park, as well as to his aunt. He had intended, about this time, to be going to London, 
but he could not leave his father and mother just when everybody else of most importance to their comfort was leaving them and with an effort felt but not boasted of he delayed for a week or two longer a journey which he was looking forward to with the hope of its fixing his happiness forever he told fanny of it she knew so much already that she must know everything it made the substance of one other confidential discourse about miss crawford and fanny was the more affected from feeling it would be the last time in which miss crawford's name would ever be mentioned between them with any remains of liberty once afterwards she was alluded to by him lady bertram had been telling her niece in the evening to write to her soon and often and promising to be a good correspondent herself and edmund at a convenient moment then added in a whisper and i shall write to you fanny when i have anything worth writing about anything to say that i think you will like to hear and that you will not hear so soon from any other quarter had she doubted his meaning while she listened the glow in his face when she looked up at him would have been decisive for this letter she must try to arm herself that a letter from edmund should be a subject of terror she began to feel that she had not yet gone through all the changes of opinion and sentiment which the progress of time and variation of circumstances occasion in this world of changes the vicissitudes of the human mind had not yet been exhausted by her poor fanny though going as she did willingly and eagerly the last evening at mansfield park must still be wretchedness her heart was completely sad at parting she had tears for every room in the house much more for every beloved inhabitant she clung to her aunt because she would miss her she kissed the hand of her uncle with struggling sobs because she had displeased him and as for edmund she could neither speak nor look nor think when the last moment came with him and it was not till it was over that she knew he was giving her the affectionate farewell of a brother all this passed overnight for the journey was to begin very early in the morning and when the small diminished party met at breakfast william and fanny were talked of as already advanced one stage end of chapter 37 librivox recordings are in the public domain This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Short Circuit. Mansfield Park by Jane Austen. Chapter 38. The novelty of traveling and the happiness of being with William soon produced their natural effect on Fanny's spirits when Mansfield Park was fairly left behind and by the time their first stage was ended and they were to quit sir thomas's carriage she was able to take leave of the old coachman and send back proper messages with cheerful looks of pleasant talk between the brother and sister there was no end everything supplied an amusement to the high glee of william's mind and he was full of frolic and joke in the intervals of their higher toned subjects all of which ended if they did not begin in praise of the thrush conjectures how she would be employed schemes for an action with some superior force which supposing the first lieutenant out of the way and william was not very merciful to the first lieutenant was to give himself the next step as soon as possible or speculations upon prize money which was to be generously distributed at home with only the reservation of enough to make the little cottage comfortable in which he and fanny were to pass all their middle and latter life together fanny's immediate concerns as far as they involved mr crawford made no part of their conversation william knew what had passed and from his heart lamented that his sister's feelings should be so cold towards a man whom he must consider as the first of human characters but he was of an age to be all for love and therefore unable to blame and knowing her wish on the subject he would not distress her by the slightest delusion she had reason to suppose herself not yet forgotten by mr crawford 
she had heard repeatedly from his sister within the three weeks which had passed since their leaving mansfield and in each letter there had been a few lines from himself warm and determined like his speeches it was a correspondence which fanny found quite as unpleasant as she had feared miss crawford's style of writing lively and affectionate was itself an evil independent of what she was thus forced into reading from the brother's pen for edmund would never rest until she had read the chief of the letter to him and then she had to listen to his admiration of her language and the warmth of her attachments there had in fact been so much of message of allusion of recollection so much of mansfield in every letter that fanny could not but suppose it meant for him to hear and to find herself forced into a purpose of that kind compelled into a correspondence which was bringing her the addresses of a man she did not love and obliging her to administer to the adverse passion of the man she did was cruelly mortifying here too her present removal promised advantage when no longer under the same roof with edmund she trusted that miss crawford would have no motive for writing strong enough to overcome the trouble and that at portsmouth their correspondence would dwindle into nothing with such thoughts as these among ten hundred others fanny proceeded in her journey safely and cheerfully and as expeditiously as could rationally be hoped in the dirty month of february they entered oxford but she could take only a hasty glimpse of edmund's college as they passed along and made no stop anywhere till they reached newbury where a comfortable meal uniting dinner and supper wound up the enjoyments and fatigues of the day the next morning saw them off again at an early hour and with no events and no delays they regularly advanced and were in the environs of portsmouth when there was yet daylight for fanny to look around her and wonder at the new buildings they passed the drawbridge and entered the town and the light was only beginning to fail as guided by william's powerful voice they were rattled into a narrow street leading from the high street and drawn up before the door of the small house now inhabited by mr price fanny was all agitation and flutter all hope and apprehension the moment they stopped a trollopy looking maid-servant seemingly in waiting for them at the door stepped forward and more intent on telling the news than giving them any help immediately began with the thrush has gone out of harbour please sir and one of the officers has been here to she was interrupted by a fine tall boy of eleven years old who rushing out of the house pushed the maid aside and while william was opening the chaise door himself called out you are just in time we have been looking for you this half hour the thrush went out of harbour this morning i saw her it was a beautiful sight and they think she'll have her orders in a day or two and mr campbell was here at four o'clock to ask for you he's got one of the freshest boats and it's going off to her at six and hoped you would be here in time to go with him a stare or two at fanny as william helped her out of the carriage was all the voluntary notice which this brother bestowed but he made no objection to her kissing him though still entirely engaged in detailing further particulars of the thrushes going out of harbour in which he had a strong right of interest being to commence his career of seamanship in her at this very time another moment and fanny was in the narrow entrance passage of the house and in her mother's arms who met her there with looks of true kindness and with features which fanny loved the more because they brought her aunt bertram's before her and there were her two sisters susan a well-grown fine girl of fourteen and betsy the youngest in the family about five both glad to see her in their way there was no advantage of manner in receiving her that manner fanny did not want would they but love her she should be satisfied she was then taken into a parlour so small that her first conviction was of its being only a passage room to something better and she stood for a moment expecting to be invited on but when she saw there was no other door and that there were signs of habitation before her she called back her thoughts reproved herself and grieved lest they should have been suspected her mother however could not stay long enough to suspect anything she was gone again to the street door to welcome william oh my dear william how glad i am to see you but have you heard about the thrush she's gone out of harbour already three days before we had any thought of it and i do not know what i am to do about sam's things they will never be ready in time for she may have her orders to-morrow perhaps it takes me quite unawares and now you must be off for spithead too campbell has been here quite in her worry about you and now what shall we do i thought to have had such a comfortable evening with you and here everything comes upon me at once her son answered cheerfully telling her that everything was always for the best 
and making light of his own inconvenience in being obliged to hurry away so soon. To be sure, I had much rather she had stayed in harbour, that I might have sat a few hours with you in comfort. But as there is a boat ashore, I had better go off at once, and there is no help for it. Whereabouts does the thrush lie at Spithead? Near the Canopus? But no matter. Here's Fanny at the parlour, and why should we stay in the passage? Come, mother, you have hardly looked at your own dear Fanny yet. And they both came, and Mrs. Price, having kindly kissed her daughter again, and commented a little on her growth, began with very natural solicitude to feel for their fatigues and wants as travellers. Poor dears! How tired you must both be! And now, what will you have? I began to think you would never come. Betsy and I have been watching for you this half hour. And when did you get anything to eat? And what would you like to have now? I could not tell whether you would be for some meat, or only a dish of tea, after your journey, or else I would have got something ready. And now I am afraid Campbell would be here, before there is time to dress a steak, and we have no butcher at hand. It is very inconvenient to have no butcher in the street. We were better off in our last house. Perhaps you would like some tea as soon as it can be got. They both declared they should prefer to anything. Then Betsy, my dear, run into the kitchen and see if Rebecca has put the water on, and tell her to bring in the tea things as soon as she can. I wish we could get the bell mended. But Betsy is a very handy little messenger. Betsy went with alacrity, proud to show her abilities before her fine new sister. Dear me, continued the anxious mother, what a sad fire we have got, and I dare say you are both starved with cold. Draw your chair nearer, my dear. I cannot think what Rebecca has been about. I am sure I told her to bring some coals half an hour ago. Susan, you should have taken care of the fire. I was upstairs, Mamma, moving my things, said Susan in a fearless, self-defending tone which startled Fanny. You know you had but just settled that my sister Fanny and I should have the other room, and I could not get Rebecca to give me any help. Further discussion was prevented by various bustles. First, the driver came to be paid. Then there was a squabble between Sam and Rebecca about the manner of carrying up his sister's trunk, which he would manage all his own way. And lastly, in walked Mr. Price himself, his own loud voice preceding him, as with something of the oath kind. He kicked away his son's portmanteau and his daughter's bandbox in the passage, and called out for a candle. No candle was brought, however, and he walked into the room. Fanny, with doubting feelings, had risen to meet him but sank down again on finding herself undistinguished in the dust, and unthought of. With a friendly shake of his son's hand and an eager voice, he instantly began. Ha! Welcome back, my boy. Glad to see you. Have you heard the news? The thrush went out of harbour this morning. Sharp is the word you see. By God, you are just in time. The doctor has been here inquiring for you. He has got one of the boats and is to be off his spithead by six, so you had better go with him. I have been to turn his about your mess. It is all in a way to be done. I should not wonder if you had your orders to-morrow, but you cannot sail with this wind if you are to cruise to the westward, and Captain Walsh thinks you will certainly have a cruise to the westward, with the elephant. By God, I wish you may, but old Sholey was saying, just now, that he thought you would be sent first to the Texel. Well, well, we are ready, whatever happens. But by God, you lost a fine sight by not being here in the morning to see the thrush go out of harbour. I would not have been out of the way for a thousand pounds. Old Sholey ran in at breakfast time to say she had clipped her moorings and was coming out. I jumped up and made but two steps to the platform. If ever there was a perfect beauty afloat, she used one. And there she lies a spit hit, and anybody in England would take her for an eight and twenty. I was upon the platform two hours this afternoon looking at her. She lies close to the endymion, between her and the Cleopatra, just to the eastward of the sheer hull. Ha! cried William. That's just where I should have put her myself. It's the best berth at Spithead. But here is my sister, sir. Here is Fanny, turning and leaning her forward. It is so dark you do not see her. With an acknowledgment that he had quite forgot her, Mr. Price now received his daughter, and, having given her a cordial hug, and observed that she was grown into a woman, and he supposed would be wanting a husband soon, seemed very much inclined to forget her again. Fanny shrank back to her seat with feelings sadly pained by his language and his smell of spirits and he talked on only to his son, and only the thrush, though William, warmly interested as he was in that subject, more than once tried to make his father think of Fanny and her long absence and long journey. After sitting some time longer, a candle was obtained, but as there was still no appearance of tea, nor, from Betsy's reports from the kitchen, much hope of any under a considerable period, 
William determined to go and change his dress and make the necessary preparations for his removal on board directly, that he might have his tea and comfort afterwards. As he left the room, two rosy-faced boys, ragged and dirty, about eight and nine years old, rushed into it just released from school, and coming eagerly to see their sister, and tell that the thrush was gone out of harbor. Tom and Charles Charles had been born since Fanny's going away, but Tom she had often helped to nurse, and now felt a particular pleasure in seeing again. Both were kissed very tenderly, but Tom she wanted to eat by her, to try to trace the features of the baby she had loved, and talked to, of his infant preference to herself. Tom, however, had no mind for such treatment. He came home, not to stand and be talked to, but to run about and make a noise, and both boys had soon burst away from her, and slammed the parlor door till her temples ached. She had now seen all that were at home. There remained only two brothers between herself and Susan, one of whom was a clerk at a public office in London, and the other a midshipman on board an Indiaman. But though she had seen all the members of the family, she had not yet heard all the noise they could make. Another quarter of an hour brought her a great deal more. William was soon calling out from the landing place of the second story for his mother and for Rebecca. He was in distress for something that he had left there and did not find again. A key was mislaid, Betsy accused of having got his new hat, and some slight but essential alteration of his uniform waistcoat, which he had been promised to have done for him, entirely neglected. Mrs. Price, Rebecca, and Betsy all went up to defend themselves, all talking together, but Rebecca loudest, and the job was to be done, as well as it could, in a great hurry. William, trying in vain to send Betsy down again, or keep her from being troublesome where she was, the whole of which is almost every door in the house was open, could be plainly distinguished in the parlor, except when drowned at intervals by the superior noise of Sam, Tom, and Charles, chasing each other up and down stairs and tumbling about and hallooing. Fanny was almost stunned. The smallness of the house and thinness of the walls brought everything so close to her that, added to the fatigue of her journey and all her recent agitation, she hardly knew how to bear it. Within the room all was tranquil enough, for Susan having disappeared with the others, there were soon only her father and herself remaining, and he, taking out a newspaper, the accustomary loan of a neighbor, applied himself to studying it, without seeming to recollect her existence. The solitary candle was held between himself and the paper without any reference to her possible convenience, but she had nothing to do, and was glad to have the light screen from her aching head, as she sat in bewildered, broken, sorrowful contemplation. She was at home. But alas, it was not such a home. She had not such a welcome as— She checked herself. She was unreasonable. What right had she to be of importance to her family? She could have none, so long lost sight of. William's concerns must be dearest. They always had been, and he had every right. Yet to have so little said or asked about herself, to have scarcely an inquiry made after Mansfield. It did pain her to have Mansfield forgotten. The friends who had done so much. The dear, dear friends. But here, one subject swallowed up all the rest. Perhaps it must be so. The destination of the thrush must be now preeminently interesting. A day or two might show the difference. She only was to blame. Yet she thought it would not have been so at Mansfield. No, in her uncle's house there would have been a consideration of times and seasons, a regulation of subject, a propriety, an attention towards everybody which there was not here. The only interruption which thoughts like these received for nearly half an hour was from the sudden thirst of her father's, not at all calculated to compose them. At a more than ordinary pitch of thumping and hallooing in the passage, he exclaimed, Devil take those young dogs! How they are singing out! Ay, Sam's voice louder than all the rest! That boy's for Perbotson! Holla, you there! Sam, stop your confounded pipe, or I shall be after you! This threat was so palpably disregarded that though within five minutes afterwards the three boys all burst into the room together and sat down, Fanny could not consider it as proof of anything more than their being for the time thoroughly fagged, which their hot faces and panting breaths seemed to prove, especially as they were still kicking each other's shins and hallooing out at sudden starts immediately under their father's eye.
The next opening at the door brought something more welcome. It was for the tea things, which she had begun almost to despair of seeing that evening. Susan and an attendant girl, whose inferior appearance informed Fanny, to her great surprise, that she had previously seen the upper servant, brought in everything necessary for the meal. Susan, looking, as she put the kettle on the fire and glanced at her sister, as if divided between the agreeable triumph of showing her activity and usefulness, and the dread of being thought to demean herself by such an office. She had been into the kitchen, she said, to hurry Sally and help make the toast, and spread the bread and butter, or she did not know when they should have got tea, and she was sure her sister must want something after a journey. Fanny was very thankful. She could not but own that she should be very glad of a little tea, and Susan immediately set about making it, as if pleased to have the employment all to herself, and with only a little unnecessary bustle, and some few injudicious attempts at keeping her brothers in better order than she could, acquitted herself very well. Fanny's spirit was as much refreshed as her body. Her head and heart were soon the better for such twelve-timed kindness. Susan had an open, sensible countenance. She was like William, and Fanny hoped to find her like him in disposition and good will towards herself. In this more placid state of things, William re-entered, followed not far by his mother and Betsy. He, completing his lieutenant's uniform, looking and moving all the taller, firmer, and more graceful for it, and with the happiest smile over his face, walked up directly to Fanny, who, rising from her seat, looked at him for a moment in speechless admiration and then threw her arms round his neck to sob out her various emotions of pain and pleasure. Anxious not to appear unhappy, she soon recovered herself, and, wiping away her tears, was able to notice and admire all the striking parts of his dress, listening with reviving spirits to his cheerful hopes of being on shore some part of every day before they sailed, and even of getting her to Spithead to see the sloop. The next bustle brought in Mr. Campbell, the surgeon of the thrush, a very well-behaved young man, who came to call for his friend, and for whom there was with some contrivance found a chair, and with some hasty washing of the young tea-makers, a cup and saucer, and after another part of an hour of earnest talk between the gentlemen, noise rising upon noise, and bustle upon bustle, men and boys at last all in motion together, the moment came for setting off. Everything was ready. William took leave and all of them were gone for the three boys in spite of their mother's entreaty determined to see their brother and mr campbell to the sally port and mr price walked off at the same time to carry back his neighbour's newspaper something like tranquillity might now be hoped for and accordingly when rebecca had been prevailed on to carry away the tea things and mrs price had walked about the room some time looking for a shirt sleeve which betsy at last hunted out from a drawer in the kitchen the small party of females were pretty well composed, and the mother, having lamented again over the impossibility of getting Sam ready in time, was at leisure to think of her eldest daughter and the friends she had come from. A few inquiries began, but one of the earliest. How did her sister Bertram manage about her servants? Was she as much plagued as herself to get to liberal servants? Soon led her mind away from Northamptonshire, and fixed it on her own domestic grievances and the shocking character of all the Portsmouth servants, of whom she believed her own two were the very worst, engrossed her completely. The Bertrams were all forgotten in detailing the faults of Rebecca, against whom Susan had also much to depose, and little Betsy a great deal more, and who did seem so thoroughly without a single recommendation, that Fanny could not help modestly presuming that her mother meant to part with her when her year was up. "'Her year!' cried Mrs. Price. I am sure I hope I shall be rid of her before she has stayed a year, for that will not be up till November. Servants are come to such a pass, my dear, in Portsmouth, that it is quite a miracle if one keeps them more than half a year. I have no hope of ever being settled, and if I was to part with Rebecca, I should only get something worse. And yet I do not think I am a very difficult mistress to please. And I am sure the place is easy enough, for there is always a girl under her, and I often do half the work myself. Fanny was silent, but not from being convinced that there might not be a remedy found for some of these evils. As she now sat looking at Betsy, she could not but think particularly of another sister, a very pretty little girl, 
whom she had left there not much younger when she went into Northamptonshire, who had died a few years afterwards. There had been something remarkably amiable about her. Fanny, in those days, had preferred her to Susan, and when news of her death had at last reached Mansfield, had for a short time been quite afflicted. The sight of Betsy brought the image of little Mary back again, but she would not have pained her mother by alluding to her for the world. While considering her with these ideas, Betsy, at a small distance, was holding out something to catch her eyes, meaning to screen it at the same time from Susan's. "'What have you got there, my love?' said Fanny. "'Come, and show it to me.' "'It was a silver knife. "'Up jumped Susan, clinging it as her own, and trying to get it away. "'The child ran to her mother's protection, and Susan could only reproach, "'which she did very warmly, and evidently hoping to interest Fanny on her side. "'It was very hard that she was not to have her own knife. "'It was her own knife. "'Little sister Mary had left it to her upon her deathbed, "'and she ought to have had it to keep herself long ago.' But Mamma kept it from her, and was always letting Betsy get hold of it. And the end of it would be that Betsy would spoil it and get it for her own, though Mamma had promised her that Betsy should not have it in her own hands. Fanny was quite shocked. Every feeling of duty, honor, and tenderness was wounded by her sister's speech and her mother's reply. "'Now, Susan,' cried Mrs. Price in a complaining voice, "'now, how can you be so cross? You are always quarreling about that knife. I wish you would not be so quarrelsome. Poor little Betsy, how cross Susan is to you. But you should not have taken it out, my dear, when I sent you to the drawer. You know I told you not to touch it, because Susan is so cross about it. I must hide it another time, Betsy. Poor Mary Little thought it would be such a bone of contention when she gave it me to keep only two hours before she died. Poor little soul! She could but just speak to be heard, and she said so prettily. Let sister Susan have my knife, mamma, when I am dead and buried. Poor little dear, she was so fond of it, Fanny, that she would have it lie by her bed all through her illness. It was the gift of her good godmother, old Mrs. Admiral Maxwell, only six weeks before she was taken for death. Poor little sweet creature. Well, she was taken away from evil to come. My own Betsy, fondling her, you have not the luck of such a good godmother. Aunt Norris lives too far off to think of such little people as you. Fanny had indeed nothing to convey from Aunt Norris, but a message to say she hoped her goddaughter was a good girl and learned her book. There had been at one moment a slight murmur in the drawing room at Mansfield Park about sending her a prayer book, but no second sound had been heard of such a purpose. Mrs. Norris, however, had gone home and taken down two old prayer books of her husband with that idea, but upon examination the ardor of generosity went off one was found to have too small a print for a child's eyes and the other to be too cumbersome for her to carry about fanny fatigued and fatigued again was thankful to accept the first invitation of going to bed and before betsy had finished her cry at being allowed to sit up only one hour extraordinary in honor of her sister she was off leaving all below in confusion and noise again the boys begging for toasted cheese, her father calling out for his rum and water, and Rebecca never where she ought to be. There was nothing to raise her spirits in the confined and scantily furnished chamber that she was to share with Susan. The smallness of the rooms above and below, indeed, and the narrowness of the passage and staircase, struck her beyond her imagination. She soon learnt to think with respect of her own little attic at Mansfield Park, and that house reckoned too small for anybody's comfort. This is the end of chapter 38 of Mansfield Park by Jane Austen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Louisa Hall. Mansfield Park by Jane Austen. Chapter 39. Could Sir Thomas have seen all his niece's feelings when she wrote her first letter to her aunt, he would not have despaired, for though a good night's rest, a pleasant morning, the hope of soon seeing William again, and the comparatively quiet state of the house, from Tom and Charles being gone to school, Sam on some project of his own, and her father on his usual lounges, enabled her to express herself cheerfully on the subject of home, 
there were still, to her own perfect consciousness, many drawbacks suppressed. Could he have seen only half that she felt before the end of a week, he would have thought Mr. Crawford sure of her, and been delighted with his own sagacity. Before the week ended, it was all disappointment. In the first place, William was gone. The thrush had had her orders, the wind had changed, and he was sailed within four days from their reaching Portsmouth, and during those days she had seen him only twice, in a short and hurried way, when he had come ashore on duty. There had been no free conversation, no walk on the ramparts, no visit to the dockyard, no acquaintance with the thrush, nothing of all that they had planned and depended on. Everything in that quarter failed her, except William's affection. His last thought on leaving home was for her. He stepped back again to the door to say, "'Take care of Fanny, mother. She is tender, and not used to rough it like the rest of us. I charge you, take care of Fanny.' William was gone, and the home he had left her in was, Fanny could not conceal it from herself, in almost every respect the very reverse of what she could have wished. It was the abode of noise, disorder, and impropriety. Nothing was in their right place, nothing was done as it ought to be. She could not respect her parents as she had hoped. On her father her confidence had not been sanguine, but he was more negligent of his family, his habits were worse, and his manners coarser than she had been prepared for. He did not want abilities, but he had no curiosity, and no information beyond his profession. He read only the newspaper and the navy list. He talked only of the dockyard, the harbour, Spithead, and the mother bank. He swore and he drank. He was dirty and gross. She had never been able to recall anything approaching to tenderness in his former treatment of herself. There had remained only a general impression of roughness and loudness, and now he scarcely ever noticed her, but to make her the object of a coarse joke. Her disappointment in her mother was greater. There she had hoped much, and found almost nothing. Every flattering scheme of being of consequence to her soon fell to the ground. Mrs. Price was not unkind, but, instead of gaining on her affection and confidence, and becoming more and more dear, her daughter never met with greater kindness from her than on the first day of her arrival. The instinct of nature was soon satisfied, and Mrs. Price's attachment had no other source. Her heart and her time were already quite full. She had neither leisure nor affection to bestow on Fanny. Her daughters never had been much to her. She was fond of her sons, especially of William, but Betsy was the first of her girls whom she had ever much regarded. To her she was most injudiciously indulgent. William was her pride, Betsy her darling, and John, Richard, Sam, Tom and Charles occupied all the rest of her maternal solicitude, alternately her worries and her comforts. These shared her heart, her time was given chiefly to her house and her servants. Her days were spent in a kind of slow bustle. All was busy without getting on always behindhand and lamenting it, without altering her ways, wishing to be an economist without contrivance or regularity, dissatisfied with her servants, without skill to make them better, and whether helping or reprimanding or indulging them, without any power of engaging their respect. Of her two sisters, Mrs. Price very much more resembled Lady Bertram than Mrs. Norris. She was a manager by necessity, without any of Mrs. Norris's inclination for it, or any of her activity. Her disposition was naturally easy and indolent, like Lady Bertram's, and a situation of similar affluence and do-nothingness would have been much more suited to her capacity than the exertions and self-denials of the one which her imprudent marriage had placed her in. She might have made just as good a woman of consequence as Lady Bertram, but Mrs. Norris would have been a more respectable mother of nine children on a small income. Much of all this Fanny could not but be sensible of. She might scruple to make use of the words, but she must and did feel that her mother was a partial, ill-judging parent, a dawdle, a slattern, who neither taught nor restrained her children, whose house was the scene of mismanagement and discomfort from beginning to end, and who had no talent, no conversation, no affection towards herself, no curiosity to know her better, no desire of her friendship, and no inclination for her company that could lessen her sense of such feelings. Fanny was very anxious to be useful, and not to appear above her home, or in any way disqualified or disinclined by her foreign education, from contributing her help to its comforts, and therefore set about working for Sam immediately. And by working early and late, with perseverance and great dispatch, did so much that the boy was shipped off at last, with more than half his linen ready. She had great pleasure in feeling her usefulness, but could not conceive how they would have managed without her. Sam, loud and overbearing as he was, she rather regretted when he went, for he was clever and intelligent, and glad to be employed in any errand in the town, and though spurning the remonstrances of Susan, given as they were, though very reasonable in themselves, with ill-timed and powerless warmth, was beginning to be influenced by Fanny's services and gentle persuasions, and she found that the best of the three younger ones was gone in him, 
Tom and Charles being at least as many years as they were his juniors distant from that age of feeling and reason, which might suggest the expediency of making friends, and of endeavouring to be less disagreeable. Their sister soon despaired of making the smallest impression on them. They were quite untamable by any means of address which she had spirits or time to attempt. Every afternoon brought a return of their riotous games all over the house, and she very early learned to sigh at the approach of Saturday's constant half-holiday. Betsy, too, a spoiled child, trained up to think the alphabet her greatest enemy, left to be with the servants at her pleasure, and then encouraged to report any evil of them. She was almost as ready to despair of being able to love or assist, and of Susan's temper she had many doubts. Her continual disagreements with her mother, her rash squabbles with Tom and Charles, and petulance with Betsy, were at least so distressing to Fanny that, though admitting they were by no means without provocation, she feared the disposition that could push them to such length must be far from amiable, and from affording any repose to herself. Such was the home which was to put Mansfield out of her head, and teach her to think of her cousin Edmund with moderated feelings. On the contrary, she could think of nothing but Mansfield, its beloved inmates, its happy ways. Everything where she now was in full contrast to it. The elegance, propriety, regularity, harmony, and perhaps, above all, the peace and tranquillity of Mansfield were brought to her remembrance every hour of the day by the prevalence of everything opposite to them here. The living in incessant noise was, to a frame and temper delicate and nervous like Fanny's, an evil which no superadded elegance or harmony could have entirely atoned for. It was the greatest misery of all. At Mansfield, no sounds of contention, no raised voice, no abrupt bursts, no tread of violence was ever heard. All proceeded in a regular course of cheerful orderliness. Everybody had their due importance, everybody's feelings were consulted. If tenderness could be ever supposed wanting, good sense and good breeding supplied its place, and as to the little irritations sometimes introduced by Aunt Norris, they were short, they were trifling, they were as a drop of water to the ocean, compared with the ceaseless tumult of her present abode. Here everybody was noisy, every voice was loud, excepting perhaps her mother's, which resembled the soft monotony of Lady Bertram's, only worn into fretfulness. Whatever was wanted was hallowed for, and the servants hallowed out their excuses from the kitchen. The doors were in constant banging, the stairs were never at rest, nothing was done without a clatter, nobody sat still, and nobody could command attention when they spoke. In a review of the two houses, as they appeared to her before the end of a week, Fanny was tempted to apply to them Dr. Johnson's celebrated judgment as to matrimony and celibacy, and say that, though Mansfield Park might have some pains, Portsmouth could have no pleasures. End of chapter 39This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Louisa Hall. Mansfield Park by Jane Austen, Chapter 40. Fanny was right enough in not expecting to hear from Miss Crawford now at the rapid rate in which their correspondence had begun. Mary's next letter was after a decidedly longer interval than the last but she was not right in supposing that such an interval would be felt a great relief to herself. Here was another strange revolution of mind. She was really glad to receive the letter when it did come. In her present exile from good society, and distance from everything that had been wont to interest her, a letter from one belonging to the set where her heart lived, written with affection and some degree of elegance, was thoroughly acceptable. The usual plea of increasing engagements was made an excuse for not having written to her earlier, and now that I have begun, she continued, my letter will not be worth your reading, for there will be no little offering of love at the end, no three or four lines passionate from the most devoted H.C. in the world, for Henry is in Norfolk. Business called him to Everingham ten days ago, or perhaps he only pretended to call, for the sake of being travelling at the same time that you were. But there he is, and by the by, his absence may sufficiently account for any remissness of his sisters in writing, for there has been no, well, Mary, when do you write to Fanny? is not at time for you to write to Fanny, to spur me on. At last, after various attempts at meeting, I have seen your cousins, dear Julia and dearest Mrs. Rushworth. They found me at home yesterday, and we were glad to see each other again. We seemed very glad to see each other, and I do really think we were a little. We had a vast deal to say. Shall I tell you how Mrs. Rushworth looked when your name was mentioned? I did not use to think her wanting in self-possession, but she had not quite enough for the demands of yesterday. Upon the whole, Julia was in best looks of the two, at least after you were spoken of. There was no recovering the complexion from the moment I spoke of Fanny, and spoke of her as a sister should. 
But Mrs. Rushworth's day of good looks will come. We have cards for her first party on the 28th. Then she will be in beauty, for she will open one of the best houses in Wimpole Street. I was in it two years ago, when it was Lady Lascelles, and prefer it to almost any I know in London. And certainly she will then feel, to use a vulgar phrase, that she has got her penny worth for her penny. Henry could not have afforded her such a house. I hope she will recollect it, and be satisfied, as well she may, with moving the queen of a palace, though the king may appear best in the background, and as I have no desire to tease her, I shall never force your name upon her again. She will grow sober by degrees. From all that I hear and guess, Baron Wildenheim's attentions to Julia continue. But I do not know that he has any serious encouragement. She ought to do better. A poor honourable is no catch, and I cannot imagine any liking in the case, for take away his rents and the poor baron has nothing. What a difference a vowel makes, if his rents were but equal to his rants. Your cousin Edmund moves slowly, detained, perchance, by parish duties. There may be some old woman at Thornton Lacey to be converted. I am unwilling to fancy myself neglected for a young one. Adieu, my dear sweet Fanny. This is a long letter from London. Write me a pretty one in reply to gladden Henry's eyes when he comes back, and send me account of all the dashing young captains whom you disdain for his sake. There was great food for meditation in this letter, and chiefly for unpleasant meditation. And yet, with all the uneasiness it supplied, it connected her with the absent, it told her of people and things about whom she had never felt so much curiosity as now, and she would have been glad to have been sure of such a letter every week. Her correspondence with her Aunt Bertram was her only concern of higher interest. As for any society in Portsmouth that could at all make amends for deficiencies at home, there were none within the circle of her father's and mother's acquaintance to afford her the smallest satisfaction. She saw nobody in whose favour she could wish to overcome her own shyness and reserve. The men appeared to her all coarse, the women all pert, everybody underbred, and she gave as little contentment as she received from introductions either to old or new acquaintance. The young ladies who approached her at first with some respect, in consideration of her coming from a baronet's family, were soon offended by what they termed airs, for, as she neither played on the piano fort nor wore fine polices, they could, on further observation, admit no right of superiority. The first solid consolation which Fanny received for the evils of home, the first which her judgment could entirely approve, and which gave any promise of durability, was in a better knowledge of Susan, and a hope of being of service to her. Susan had always behaved pleasantly to herself, but the determined character of her general manners had astonished and alarmed her, and it was at least a fortnight before she began to understand a disposition so totally different from her own. Susan saw that much was wrong at home, and wanted to set it right. That a girl of fourteen, acting only on her own unassisted reason, should err in the method of reform, was not wonderful, and Fanny soon became more disposed to admire the natural light of the mind which could so early distinguish justly than to censure severely the faults of conduct to which it led. Susan was only acting on the same truths, and pursuing the same system, which her own judgment acknowledged, but which her more supine and yielding temper would have shrunk from asserting. Susan tried to be useful, where she could only have gone away and cried, and that Susan was useful she could perceive, that things, bad as they were, would have been worse but for such interposition, and that both her mother and Betsy were restrained from some excesses of very offensive indulgence and vulgarity. In every argument with her mother, Susan had in point of reason the advantage, and never was there any maternal tenderness to buy her off. The blind fondness which was forever producing evil around her she had never known. There was no gratitude for affection past or present to make her better bear with its excesses to the others. All this became gradually evident, and gradually placed Susan before her sister as an object of mingled compassion and respect. That her manner was wrong, however, at times very wrong, her measures often ill-chosen and ill-timed, and her looks and language very often indefensible, Fanny could not cease to feel, but she began to hope they might be rectified. Susan, she found, looked up to her, and wished for her good opinion, and, knew as anything like an office of authority was to Fanny, knew as it was to imagine herself capable of guiding or informing any one, she did resolve to give occasional hints to Susan and endeavour to exercise for her advantage the juster notions of what was due to everybody, and what would be wisest for herself, which her own more favoured education had fixed in her. Her influence, or at least the consciousness and use of it, originated in an act of kindness by Susan, which, after many hesitations of delicacy, she at last worked herself up to. It had very early occurred to her that a small sum of money might, perhaps, restore peace forever on the sore subject of the silver knife, canvassed as it now was continually, and the riches which she was in possession of herself, her uncle having given her ten at parting, made her as able as she was willing to be generous. 
but she was so wholly unused to confer favours, except on the very poor, so unpractised in removing evils, or bestowing kindnesses among her equals, and so fearful of appearing to elevate herself as a great lady at home, that it took some time to determine that it would not be unbecoming in her to make such a present. It was made, however, at last. A silver knife was bought for Betsy, and accepted with great delight, its newness giving it every advantage over the other that could be desired. Susan was established in the full possession of her own, Betsy handsomely declaring that now she had got one so much prettier herself, she should never want that again, and no reproach seemed conveyed to the equally satisfied mother, which Fanny had almost feared to be impossible. The deed thoroughly answered, a source of domestic altercation was entirely done away, and it was the means of opening Susan's heart to her, and giving her something more to love and be interested in. Susan showed that she had delicacy. Pleased as she was to be mistress of property which she had been struggling for at least two years, she yet feared that her sister's judgment had been against her, and that a reproof was designed her for having so struggled as to make the purchase necessary for the tranquillity of the house. Her temper was open. She acknowledged her fears, blamed herself for having contended so warmly, and from that hour Fanny, understanding the worth of her disposition and perceiving how fully she was inclined to seek her good opinion and refer to her judgment, began to feel again the blessing of affection, and to entertain the hope of being useful to a mind so much in need of help, and so much deserving it. She gave advice, advice too sound to be resisted by a good understanding, and given so mildly and considerately as not to irritate an imperfect temper, and she had the happiness of observing its good effects not unfrequently. More was not expected by one who, while seeing all the obligation and expediency of submission and forbearance, saw also with sympathetic acuteness of feeling all that must be hourly grating to a girl like Susan. Her greatest wonder on the subject soon became, not that Susan should have been provoked into disrespect and impatience against her better knowledge, but that so much better knowledge, so many good notions should have been hers at all, and that, brought up in the midst of negligence and error, she should have formed such proper opinions of what ought to be, she who had had no cousin Edmund to direct her thoughts or fix her principles. The intimacy thus begun between them was a material advantage to each. By sitting together upstairs, they avoided a great deal of the disturbance of the house. Fanny had peace, and Susan learned to think it no misfortune to be quietly employed. They sat without a fire, but that was a privation familiar even to Fanny, and she suffered the less because reminded by it of the East Room. It was the only point of resemblance. In space, light, furniture and prospect, there was nothing alike in the two apartments, and she often heaved a sigh at the remembrance of all her books and boxes, and various comforts there. By degrees the girls came to spend the chief of the morning upstairs, at first only in working and talking, but after a few days the remembrance of the said books grew so potent and stimulative that Fanny found it impossible not to try for books again. There were none in her father's house, but wealth is luxurious and daring, and some of hers found its way to a circulating library. She became a subscriber, amazed at being anything, in proprietor persona, amazed at her own doings in every way, to be a renter, a chooser of books, and to be having any one's improvement in view in her choice, but so it was. Susan had read nothing, and Fanny longed to give her a share in her own first pleasures, and inspire a taste for the biography and poetry which she delighted in herself. In this occupation she hoped, moreover, to bury some of the recollections of Mansfield, which were too apt to seize her mind if her fingers only were busy, and, especially at this time, hoped it might be useful in diverting her thoughts from pursuing Edmund to London, whither, on the authority of her aunt's last letter, she knew he was gone. She had no doubt of what would ensue. The promised notification was hanging over her head. The postman's knock within the neighbourhood was beginning to bring its daily terrors, and if reading could banish the idea for even half an hour, it was something gained. End of chapter 40「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Louisa Hall Mansfield Park by Jane Austen, Chapter 41 A week was gone since Edmund might be supposed in town, and Fanny had heard nothing of him. There were three different conclusions to be drawn from his silence, between which her mind was in fluctuation each of them at times being held the most probable. Either his going had been again delayed, or he had yet procured no opportunity of seeing Miss Crawford alone, or he was too happy for letter-writing. One morning, about this time, 
Fanny having now been nearly four weeks from Mansfield, a point which she never failed to think over and calculate every day. As she and Susan were preparing to remove, as usual, upstairs, they were stopped by the knock of a visitor, whom they felt they could not avoid, from Rebecca's alertness in going to the door, a duty which always interested her beyond any other. It was a gentleman's voice. It was a voice that Fanny was just turning pale about when Mr. Crawford walked into the room. Good sense, like hers, will always act when really called upon, and she found that she had been able to name him to her mother and recall her remembrance of the name as that of William's friend, though she could not previously have believed herself capable of uttering a syllable at such a moment. The consciousness of his being known there only as William's friend was some support. Having introduced him, however, and being all reseated, the terrors that occurred of what this visit might lead to were overpowering, and she fancied herself on the point of fainting away. While trying to keep herself alive, their visitor, who had at first approached her with as animated a countenance as ever, was wisely and kindly keeping his eyes away, and giving her time to recover, while he devoted himself entirely to her mother, addressing her and attending to her with the utmost politeness and propriety, at the same time with a degree of friendliness, of interest at least, which was making his manner perfect. Mrs. Price's manners were also at their best. Warmed by the sight of such a friend to her son, and regulated by the wish of appearing to advantage before him, she was overflowing with gratitude, artless maternal gratitude, which could not be unpleasing. Mr. Price was out, which she regretted very much. Fanny was just recovered enough to feel that she could not regret it, for to her many other sources of uneasiness was added the severe one of shame for the home in which he found her. She might scold herself for the weakness, but there was no scolding it away. She was ashamed, and she would have been yet more ashamed of her father than of all the rest. They talked of William, a subject on which Mrs. Price could never tire, and Mr. Crawford was as warm in his commendation as even her heart could wish. She felt that she had never seen so agreeable a man in her life, and was only astonished to find that, so great and so agreeable as he was, he should be come down to Portsmouth neither on a visit to the Port Admiral, nor the Commissioner, nor yet with the intention of going over to the island, nor of seeing the dockyard. Nothing of all that she had been used to think of as the proof of importance, or the employment of wealth, had brought him to Portsmouth. He had reached it late the night before, was come for a day or two, was staying at the Crown, had accidentally met with a Navy officer or two of his acquaintance since his arrival, but had no object of that kind in coming. By the time he had given all this information, it was not unreasonable to suppose that Fanny might be looked at and spoken to, and she was tolerably able to bear his eye, and hear that he had spent half an hour with his sister the evening before his leaving London, that she had sent her best and kindest love, but had had no time for writing, that he thought himself lucky in seeing Mary for even half an hour, having spent scarcely twenty-four hours in London, after his return from Norfolk, before he set off again that her cousin Edmund was in town, had been in town, he understood, a few days, that he had not seen him himself, but that he was well, had left them all well at Mansfield, and was to dine, as yesterday, with the Frasers. Fanny listened collectedly, even to the last-mentioned circumstance. Nay, it seemed a relief to her worn mind to be at any certainty, and the words, then by this time it is all settled, passed internally, without more evidence of emotion than a faint blush. After talking a little more about Mansfield, a subject in which her interest was most apparent, Crawford began to hint at the expediency of an early walk. It was a lovely morning, and at that season of the year a fine morning so often turned off, that it was wisest for everybody not to delay their exercise, and such hints producing nothing, he soon proceeded to a positive recommendation to Mrs. Price and her daughters to take their walk without loss of time. Now they came to an understanding. Mrs. Price, it appeared, scarcely ever stirred out of doors, except of a Sunday. She owned she could seldom, with her large family, find time for a walk. Would she not, then, persuade her daughters to take advantage of such weather, and allow him the pleasure of attending them? Mrs. Price was greatly obliged and very complying. Her daughters were very much confined. Portsmouth was a sad place, they did not often get out, and she knew they had some errands in the town, which they would be very glad to do and the consequence was that Fanny, strange as it was, strange, awkward, and distressing, found herself and Susan, within ten minutes, walking towards the high street with Mr. Crawford. It was soon pain upon pain, confusion upon confusion, for they were hardly in the high street before they met her father, whose appearance was not the better for its being Saturday. He stopped, and, ungentlemanlike as he looked, Fanny was obliged to introduce him to Mr. Crawford. She could not have a doubt of the manner in which Mr. Crawford must be struck. He must be ashamed and disgusted altogether. 
he must soon give her up and cease to have the smallest inclination for the match, and yet, though she had been so much wanting his affection to be cured, this was a sort of cure that would be almost as bad as a complaint, and I believe there is scarcely a young lady in the United Kingdoms who would not rather put up with the misfortune of being sought by a clever, agreeable man than have him driven away by the vulgarity of her nearest relations. Mr. Crawford probably could not regard his future father-in-law with any idea of taking him for a model in dress, but, as Fanny instantly and to her great relief discerned, her father was a very different man, a very different Mr. Price in his behaviour to this most highly respected stranger, from what he was in his own family at home. His manners now, though not polished, were more than passable. They were grateful, animated, manly. His expressions were those of an attached father and a sensible man. His loud tones did very well in the open air, and there was not a single oath to be heard. Such was his instinctive compliment to the good manners of Mr. Crawford, and, be the consequence what it might, Fanny's immediately feelings were infinitely soothed. The conclusion of the two gentlemen's civilities was an offer of Mr. Price's to take Mr. Crawford into the dockyard, which Mr. Crawford, desirous of accepting as a favour what was intended as such, though he had seen the dockyard again and again, and hoping to be so much the longer with Fanny, was very gratefully disposed to avail himself of, if the Miss Price's were not afraid of the fatigue. And as it was somehow or other ascertained, or inferred, or at least acted upon, that they were not at all afraid, to the dockyard they were all to go, and but for Mr. Crawford, Mr. Price would have turned thither directly, without the smallest consideration for his daughter's errands in the high street. He took care, however, that they should be allowed to go to the shops they came out expressly to visit, and it did not delay them long, for Fanny could so little bear to excite impatience, or be waited for, that before the gentlemen, as they stood at the door, could do more than begin upon the last naval regulations, or settle the number of three-deckers now in commission, their companions were ready to proceed. They were then to set forward for the dockyard at once, and the walk would have been conducted, according to Mr. Crawford's opinion, in a singular manner, had Mr. Price been allowed the entire regulation of it, as the two girls, he found, would have been left to follow, and keep up with them or not, as they could, while they walked on together at their own hasty pace. He was able to introduce some improvement occasionally, though by no means to the extent he wished. He absolutely would not walk away from them, and at any crossing or any crowd, when Mr. Price was only calling out, "'Come, girls, come! Fan, come! Sue, take care of yourselves! Keep a sharp lookout!' he would give them his particular attendance. Once fairly in the dockyard, he began to reckon upon some happy intercourse with Fanny, as they were very soon joined by a brother lounger of Mr. Price's, who was come to take his daily survey of how things went on, and who must prove a far more worthy companion than himself. And after a time the two officers seemed very well satisfied going about together, and discussing matters of equal and never-failing interest, while the young people sat down upon some timbers in the yard, or found a seat on board a vessel in the stocks which they all went to look at. Fanny was most conveniently in want of rest. Crawford could not have wished her more fatigued or more ready to sit down, but he could have wished her sister away. A quick-looking girl of Susan's age was the very worst third in the world, totally different from Lady Bertram, all eyes and ears, and there was no introducing the main point before her. He must content himself with being only generally agreeable, and letting Susan have her share of entertainment, with the indulgence now and then of a look or hint for the better informed and conscious Fanny. Norfolk was what he had mostly to talk of, there he had been some time, and everything there was rising in importance from his present schemes. Such a man could come from no place, no society, without importing something to amuse. His journeys and his acquaintance were all of use, and Susan was entertained in a way quite new to her. For Fanny, something more was related than the accidental agreeableness of the parties he had been in. For her approbation, the particular reason of his going into Norfolk at all, at this unusual time of year, was given. It had been real business, relative to the renewal of a lease in which the welfare of a large and, he believed, industrious family was at stake. He had suspected his agent of some underhand dealing, of meaning to bias him against the deserving, and he had determined to go himself and thoroughly investigate the merits of the case. He had gone, had done even more good than he had foreseen, had been useful to more than his first plan had comprehended, and was now able to congratulate himself upon it, and to feel that in performing a duty he had secured agreeable recollections for his own mind. He had introduced himself to some tenants whom he had never seen before, he had begun making acquaintance with cottagers whose very existence, though on his own estate, had been hitherto unknown to him. This was aimed, and well aimed, at Fanny. It was pleasing to hear him speak so properly. Here he had been acting as he ought to do. To be the friend of the poor and the oppressed. 
Nothing could be more grateful to her, and she was on the point of giving him an approving look, when it was all frightened off by his adding a something too pointed of his hoping soon to have an assistant, a friend, a guide in every plan of utility or charity for Everingham, a somebody that would make Everingham and all about it a dearer object than it had ever been yet. She turned away, and wished he would not say such things. She was willing to allow he might have more good qualities than she had been wont to suppose. She began to feel the possibility of his turning out well at last, but he was and must ever be completely unsuited to her, and ought not to think of her. He perceived that enough had been said of Everingham, and that it would be as well to talk of something else, and turned to Mansfield. He could not have chosen better. That was a topic to bring back her attention and her looks almost instantly. It was a real indulgence to her to hear or to speak of Mansfield. Now so long divided from everybody who knew the place, she felt it quite the voice of a friend when he mentioned it, and led the way to her fond exclamations in praise of its beauties and comforts, and by his honourable tribute to its inhabitants allowed her to gratify her own heart in the warmest eulogium, in speaking of her uncle as all that was clever and good, and her aunt as having the sweetest of all sweet tempers. He had a great attachment to Mansfield himself, he said so, and he looked forward with the hope of spending much, very much of his time there, always there, or in the neighbourhood. He particularly built upon a very happy summer and autumn there this year, he felt that it would be so, he depended upon it, a summer and autumn infinitely superior to the last. As animated, as diversified, as social, but with circumstances of superiority undescribable. Mansfield, Southerton, Thornton Lacey, he continued, what a society will be comprised in those houses! And at Michaelmas, perhaps, a fourth may be added, some small hunting box in the vicinity of everything so dear. For as to any partnership in Thornton Lacey, as Edmund Bertram once good-humouredly proposed, I hope I foresee two objections, two fair, excellent, irresistible objections to that plan. Fanny was doubly silenced here, though when the moment was past, could regret that she had not forced herself into the acknowledged comprehension of one half of his meaning, and encouraged him to say something more of his sister and Edmund. It was a subject which she must learn to speak of, and the weakness that shrunk from it would soon be quite unpardonable. When Mr. Price and his friend had seen all that they wished, or had time for, the others were ready to return, and in the course of their walk back, Mr. Crawford contrived a minute's privacy for telling Fanny that his only business in Portsmouth was to see her, that he was come down for a couple of days on her account, and hers only, and because he could not endure a longer total separation. She was sorry, really sorry, and yet in spite of this and the two or three other things which she wished he had not said, she thought him altogether improved since she had seen him. He was much more gentle, obliging, and attentive to other people's feelings than he had ever been at Mansfield. She had never seen him so agreeable, so near being agreeable. His behaviour to her father could not offend, and there was something particularly kind and proper in the notice he took of Susan. He was decidedly improved. She wished the next day over. She wished he had come only for one day. But it was not so very bad as she would have expected. The pleasure of talking of Mansfield was so very great. Before they parted, she had to thank him for another pleasure, and one of no trivial kind. Her father asked him to do them the honour of taking his mutton with them, and Fanny had time for only one thrill of horror before he declared himself prevented by a prior engagement. He was engaged to dinner already both for that day and the next. He had met with some acquaintance of the Crown who would not be denied. He should have the honour, however, of waiting on them again on the morrow, etc., and so they parted. Fanny in a state of actual felicity from escaping so horrible an evil. To have had him join their family dinner party and see all their deficiencies would have been dreadful. Rebecca's cookery and Rebecca's waiting, and Betsy's eating at table without restraint and pulling everything about as she chose, were what Fanny herself was not yet enough inured to for her often to make a tolerable meal. She was nice only from natural delicacy, but he had been brought up in a school of luxury and epicurism. End of chapter 41 <coughs>
Nature had given them no inconsiderable share of beauty, and every Sunday dressed them in their cleanest skins and best attire. Sunday always brought this comfort to Fanny, and on this Sunday she felt it more than ever. Her poor mother now did not look so very unworthy of being Lady Bertram's sister as she was but too apt to look. It often grieved her to the heart to think of the contrast between them, to think that where nature had made so little difference, circumstances should have made so much, and that her mother, as handsome as Lady Bertram, and some years her junior, should have an appearance so much more worn and faded, so comfortless, so slatternly, so shabby. But Sunday made her a very creditable and tolerably cheerful-looking Mrs. Price, coming abroad with a fine family of children, feeling a little respite of her weekly cares, and only discomposed if she saw her boys run into danger, or Rebecca pass by with a flower in her hat. In chapel they were obliged to divide, but Mr. Crawford took care not to be divided from the female branch, and after chapel he still continued with them, and made one in the family party on the ramparts. Mrs. Price took her weekly walk on the ramparts every fine Sunday throughout the year, always going directly after morning service and staying till dinner time. It was her public place. There she met her acquaintance, heard a little news, talked over the badness of the Portsmouth servants, and wound up her spirits for the six days ensuing. Thither they now went, Mr. Crawford most happy to consider the Miss Prices as his peculiar charge, and before they had been there long, somehow or other, there was no saying how, Fanny could not have believed it, but he was walking between them with an arm of each under his, and she did not know how to prevent or put an end to it. It made her uncomfortable for a time, but yet there were enjoyments in the day and in the view which would be felt. The day was uncommonly lovely. It was really March, but it was April in its mild air, brisk soft wind, and bright sun, occasionally clouded for a minute, and everything looked so beautiful under the influence of such a sky, the effects of the shadows pursuing each other on the ships at Spithead and the island beyond, with the ever-varying hues of the sea, now at high water, dancing in its glee and dashing against the ramparts with so fine a sound, produced altogether such a combination of charms for Fanny, as made her gradually almost careless of the circumstances under which she felt them. Nay, had she been without his arm, she would soon have known that she needed it, for she wanted strength for a two hours' saunter of this kind, coming, as it generally did, upon a week's previous inactivity. Fanny was beginning to feel the effect of being debarred from her usual regular exercise. She had lost ground as to health since her being in Portsmouth, and but for Mr. Crawford and the beauty of the weather would soon have been knocked up now. The loveliness of the day, and of the view, he felt like herself. They often stopped with the same sentiment and taste, leaning against the wall some minutes to look and admire, and considering he was not Edmund, Fanny could not but allow that he was sufficiently open to the charms of nature, and very well able to express his admiration. She had a few tender reveries now and then, which he could sometimes take advantage of to look in her face without detection, and the result of these looks was, that though, as bewitching as ever, her face was less blooming than it ought to be. She said she was very well, and did not like to be supposed otherwise, but take it all in all, he was convinced that her present residence could not be comfortable, and therefore could not be salutary for her, and he was growing anxious for her being again at Mansfield, where her own happiness, and his in seeing her, must be so much greater. "'You have been here a month, I think,' said he. "'No, not quite a month. It is only four weeks to-morrow since I left Mansfield.' "'You are a most accurate and honest reckoner. I should call that a month.' "'I did not arrive here until Tuesday evening.' "'And it is to be a two-months visit, is it not?' "'Yes, my uncle talked of two months. I suppose it will not be less. "'And how are you to be conveyed back again? Who comes for you?' "'I do not know. I have heard nothing about it yet from my aunt. Perhaps I may be to stay longer. It may not be convenient for me to be fetched exactly at the two-months' end.' After a moment's reflection, Mr. Crawford replied, "'I know, Mansfield, I know its way. I know its faults towards you. I know the danger of your being so far forgotten as to have your comforts give way to the imaginary convenience of any single being in the family. I am aware that you may be left here week after week if Sir Thomas cannot settle everything for coming himself, or sending your aunt's maid for you, without involving the slightest alteration of the arrangements which he may have laid down for the next quarter of a year. This will not do.' Two months is an ample allowance. I should think six weeks quite enough. I am considering your sister's health, said he, addressing himself to Susan, which I think the confinement of Portsmouth unfavourable to. She requires constant air and exercise. When you know her as well as I do, I am sure you will agree that she does, and that she ought never to be long banished from the free air and liberty of the country. 
If, therefore, turning again to Fanny, you find yourself growing unwell, and any difficulties arise about your returning to Mansfield, without waiting for the two months to be ended, that must not be regarded as of any consequence if you feel yourself at all less strong or comfortable than usual, and will only let my sister know it, give her only the slightest hint, she and I will immediately come down and take you back to Mansfield. You know the ease and the pleasure with which this would be done. You know all that would be felt on the occasion. Fanny thanked him, but tried to laugh it off. I am perfectly serious, he replied, as you perfectly know, and I hope you will not be cruelly concealing any tendency to indisposition. Indeed, you shall not. It shall not be in your power, for so long only as you positively say, in every letter to Mary, I am well, and I know you cannot speak or write a falsehood, so long only shall you be considered as well. Fanny thanked him again, but was affected and distressed to a degree that made it impossible for her to say much, or even to be certain of what she ought to say. This was towards the close of their walk. He attended them to the last, and left them only at the door of their own house, when he knew them to be going to dinner, and therefore pretended to be waited for elsewhere. "'I wish you were not so tired,' said he, still detaining Fanny after all the others were in the house. "'I wish I left you in stronger health. Is there anything I can do for you in town? I have half an idea of going into Norfolk again soon. I am not satisfied about Madison. I am sure he still means to impose on me if possible, and get a cousin of his own into a certain mill, which I designed for somebody else. I must come to an understanding with him.' I must make him know that I will not be tricked on the south side of Everingham any more than on the north, that I will be master of my own property. I was not explicit enough with him before. The mischief such a man does on an estate, both as to the credit of his employer and the welfare of the poor, is inconceivable. I have a great mind to go back into Norfolk directly, and put everything at once on such a footing as cannot be afterwards swerved from. Madison is a clever fellow. I do not wish to displace him, provided he does not try to displace me, but it would be simple to be duped by a man who has no right of creditor to dupe me, and worse than simple to let him give me a hard-hearted, griping fellow for a tenant, instead of an honest man, to whom I have given half a promise already. Would it not be worse than simple? Shall I go? Do you advise it? I advise. You know very well what is right. Yes, when you give me your opinion I always know what is right. Your judgment is my rule of right. Oh, no, do not say so. We have all a better guide in ourselves, if we would attend to it, than any other person can be. Good-bye. I wish you a pleasant journey to-morrow. Is there nothing I can do for you in town? Nothing. I am much obliged to you. Have you no message for anybody? My love to your sister, if you please. And when you see my cousin, my cousin Edmund, I wish you would be so good as to say that I suppose I shall soon hear from him. Certainly, and if he is lazy or negligent, I will write his excuses myself. He could say no more, for Fanny would be no longer detained. He pressed her hand, looked at her, and was gone. He went to while away the next three hours as he could, with his other acquaintance, till the best dinner that a capital inn afforded was ready for their enjoyment, and she turned into her more simple one immediately. Their general fare bore a very different character, and could he have suspected how many privations, besides that of exercise, she endured in her father's house, he would have wondered that her looks were not much more affected than he found them. She was so little equal to Rebecca's puddings and Rebecca's hashes, brought to table, as they all were, with such accompaniments of half-cleaned plates, and not half-cleaned knives and forks, that she was very often constrained to defer her heartiest meal till she could send her brothers in the evening for biscuits and buns. After being nursed up at Mansfield, it was too late in the day to be hardened at Portsmouth, and though Sir Thomas, had he known all, might have thought his niece in the most promising way of being starved, both mind and body, into a much juster value for Mr. Crawford's good company and good fortune, he would probably have feared to push his experiment farther, lest she might die under the cure. Fanny was out of spirits all the rest of the day. Though tolerably secure of not seeing Mr. Crawford again, she could not help being low. It was parting with somebody of the nature of a friend, and though, in one light, glad to have him gone, it seemed as if she was now deserted by everybody. It was a sort of renewed separation from Mansfield, and she could not think of his returning to town, and being frequently with Mary and Edmund, without feeling so near akin to envy as made her hate herself for having them. Her dejection had no abatement from anything passing around her. A friend or two of her father's, as always happened if he was not with them, spent the long, long evening there and from six o'clock till half-past nine there was little intermission of noise or grog. She was very low. The wonderful improvement which she still fancied in Mr. Crawford was the nearest to administering comfort of anything within the current of her thoughts. 
not considering in how different a circle she had just been seeing him, nor how much might be owing to contrast, she was quite persuaded of his being astonishingly more gentle and regardful of others than formerly. And, if in little things, must it not be so in great? So anxious for her health and comfort, so very feeling as he now expressed himself, and really seemed, might not it be fairly supposed that he would not much longer persevere in a suit so distressing to her? End of chapter 42This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Gazina. Mansfield Park by Jane Austen. Chapter 43. It was presumed that Mr. Crawford was travelling back to London on the morrow, for nothing more was seen of him at Mr. Price's, and two days afterwards, it was a fact ascertained to Fanny by the following letter from his sister, opened and read by her on another account, with the most anxious curiosity. I have to inform you, my dearest Fanny, that Henry has been down to Portsmouth to see you, that he had a delightful walk with you to the dockyard last Saturday, and one still more to be dwelt on the next day, to the ramparts, when the balmy air, the sparkling sea, and your sweet looks and conversation were altogether in the most delicious harmony, and afforded sensations which are to raise ecstasy even in retrospect. This, as well as I understand, is to be the substance of my information. He makes me write, but I do not know what else is to be communicated, except this said visit to Portsmouth and these two said walks, and his introduction to your family especially to a fair sister of yours, a fine girl of fifteen, who was of the party on the ramparts, taking her first lesson, I presume, in love. I have not time for writing much, but it would be out of place if I had, for this is to be a mere letter of business, penned for the purpose of conveying necessary information, which could not be delayed without risk of evil. My dear, dear Fanny, if I had you here, how I would talk to you, you should listen to me till you were tired, and advise me till you were still tired more. But it is impossible to put a hundredth part of my great mind on paper, so I will abstain altogether, and leave you to guess what you like. I have no news for you. I have politics, of course, and it would be too bad to plague you with the names of people and parties that fill up my time. I ought to have sent you an account of your cousin's first party, but I was lazy, and now it is too long ago. Suffice it that everything was just as it ought to be, in a style that any of her connections must have been gratified to witness, and that her own dress and manners did her the greatest credit. My friend, Mrs. Fraser, is mad for such a house, and it would not make me miserable. I go to Lady Stornoway after Easter. She seems in high spirits and very happy. I fancy Lord S. is very good-humoured and pleasant, in his own family, and I do not think him so very ill-looking as I did, at least one sees many worse. He will not do by the side of your cousin Edmund. Of the last-mentioned hero, what shall I say? If I avoided his name entirely, it would look suspicious. I will say, then, that we have seen him two or three times, and that my friends here are very much struck with his gentlemanlike appearance. Mrs. Fraser, no bad judge, declares that she knows but three men in town who have so good a person, height, and air, and I must confess, when he dined here the other day, there were none to compare with him, and we were a party of sixteen. Luckily there is no distinction of dress nowadays to tell tales, but, but, but yours affectionately. I had almost forgot it was Edmund's fault. He gets into my head more than does me good. One very material thing I had to say from Henry and myself. I mean about our taking you back into Northamptonshire. My dear little creature, do not stay at Portsmouth to lose your pretty looks. Those vile sea breezes are the ruin of beauty and health. My poor aunt always felt affected, if within ten miles of the sea, which the Admiral of course never believed, but I know it was so. I am at your service and Henry's. 
at an hour's notice. I should like the scheme, and we would make a little circuit, and show you Everingham in our way, and perhaps you would not mind passing through London, and seeing the outside of St. George's, Hanover Square. Only keep your cousin Edmund from me at such a time. I should not like to be tempted. What a long letter! One word more. Henry, I find, has some idea of going into Norfolk again, upon some business that you approve. But this cannot possibly be permitted before the middle of next week. That is, he cannot anyhow be spared till after the fourteenth, for we have a party that evening. The value of a man like Henry, on such an occasion, is what he can have no conception of. So you must take it upon my word to be inestimable. He will see the Rushworths, which own I am not sorry for, having little curiosity, and so I think has he, though he will not acknowledge it. This was a letter to be run through eagerly, to be read deliberately, to supply matter for much reflection, and to leave everything in greater suspense than ever. The only certainty to be drawn from it was that nothing decisive had yet taken place. Edmund had not yet spoken. How Miss Crawford really felt, how she meant to act, or might act, without or against her meaning, whether his importance to her were quite what it had been before the last separation, whether, if lessened, it were likely to lessen more, or to recover itself, were subjects for endless conjecture, and to be thought of on that day and many days to come, without producing any conclusion. The idea that returned the oftenest was that Miss Crawford, after proving herself cooled and staggered by a return to London habits, would yet prove herself, in the end, too much attached to him to give him up. She would try to be more ambitious than her heart would allow. She would hesitate, she would tease, she would condition. She would require a great deal, but she would finally accept. This was Fanny's most frequent expectation. A house in town, that, she thought, must be impossible. Yet there was no saying what Miss Crawford might not ask. The prospect for her cousin grew worse and worse. The woman who could speak of him, and speak only of his appearance. What an unworthy attachment! To be deriving support from the commendations of Mrs. Fraser. She, who had known him intimately, half a year. Fanny was ashamed of her. Those parts of the letter which related only to Mr. Crawford and herself touched her, in comparison, slightly. Whether Mr. Crawford went into Norfolk before or after the 14th was certainly no concern of hers, though everything considered, she thought he would go without delay. That Miss Crawford should endeavour to secure a meeting between him and Mrs. Rushworth was all in her worst line of conduct, and grossly unkind and ill-judged but she hoped he would not be actuated by any such degrading curiosity. He acknowledged no such inducement, and his sister ought to have given him credit for better feelings than her own. She was yet more impatient for another letter from town after receiving this than she had been before, and for a few days was so unsettled by it altogether, by what had come, and what might come, that her usual readings and conversations with Susan were much suspended. She could not command her attention as she wished. If Mr. Crawford remembered her message to her cousin, she thought it very likely, most likely, that he would write to her at all events. It would be most consistent with his usual kindness. And till she got rid of this idea, till it gradually wore off, by no letters appearing in the course of three or four days more, she was in a most restless, anxious state. At length, a something like composure succeeded. Suspense must be submitted to, and must not be allowed to wear her out and make her useless. Time did something, her own exertions something more, and she resumed her attentions to Susan, and again awakened the same interest in them. Susan was growing very fond of her, and though without any of the early delight in books which had been so strong in Fanny, with a disposition much less inclined to sedentary pursuits, or to information for information's sake, she had so strong a desire of not appearing ignorant 
as, with a good clear understanding, made her a most attentive, profitable, thankful pupil. Fanny was her oracle. Fanny's explanations and remarks were a most important addition to every essay or every chapter of history. What Fanny told her of former times dwelt more on her mind than the pages of Goldsmith, and she paid her sister the compliment of preferring her style to that of any printed author. The early habit of reading was wanting. Their conversations, however, were not always on subjects so high as history or morals. Others had their hour, and of lesser matters none returned so often, remained so long between them as Mansfield Park, a description of the people, the manners, the amusements, the ways of Mansfield Park. Susan, who had an innate taste for the genteel and well-appointed, was eager to hear, and Fanny could not but indulge herself in dwelling on so beloved a theme. She hoped it was not wrong, though after a time Susan's very great admiration of everything said or done in her uncle's house, and earnest longing to go into Northamptonshire, seemed almost to blame her for exciting feelings which could not be gratified. Poor Susan was very little better fitted for home than her elder sister, and as Fanny grew thoroughly to understand this, she began to feel that when her own release from Portsmouth came, her happiness would have a material drawback in leaving Susan behind. That a girl so capable of being made everything good should be left in such hands distressed her more and more. Were she likely to have a home to invite her to, what a blessing it would be! And had it been possible for her to return Mr. Crawford's regard, the probability of his being very far from objecting to such a measure would have been the greatest increase of all her own comforts. She thought it was really good-tempered, and could fancy his entering into a plan of that sort most pleasantly. End of chapter 43 Recorded by Gesine in February 2007「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. » Recorded by Gesine Mansfield Park by Jane Austen Chapter 44 Seven weeks of the two months were very nearly gone, when the one letter, the letter from Edmund, so long expected, was put into Fanny's hands. As she opened and saw its length, she prepared herself for a minute detail of happiness and a profusion of love and praise towards the fortunate creature who was now mistress of his fate. These were the contents. My dear Fanny, excuse me that I have not written before. Crawford told me that you were wishing to hear from me, but I found it impossible to write from London, and persuaded myself that you would understand my silence. Could I have sent a few happy lines, they should not have been wanting, but nothing of that nature was ever in my power. I am returned to Mansfield in a less assured state than when I left it. My hopes are much weaker. You are probably aware of this already. So very fond of you as Miss Crawford is, it is most natural that she should tell you enough of her own feelings to furnish a tolerable guess at mine. I will not be prevented, however, from making my own communication. Our confidences in you need not clash. I ask no questions. There is something soothing in the idea that we have the same friend, and that whatever unhappy differences of opinion may exist between us, we are united in our love of you. It will be a comfort to me to tell you how things now are, and what are my present plans, if plans I can be said to have. I have been returned since Saturday. I was three weeks in London, and saw her, for London, very often. I had every attention from the phrases that could be reasonably expected. I dare say I was not reasonable in carrying with me hopes of an intercourse at all like that of Mansfield. It was her manner, however, rather than any unfrequency of meeting. Had she been different when I did see her, I should have made no complaint, but from the very first she was altered, 
my first reception was so unlike what I had hoped, that I almost resolved on leaving London again directly. I need not particularize. You know the weak side of her character, and may imagine the sentiments and expressions which were torturing me. She was in high spirits, and surrounded by those who were giving all the support of their own bad sense to her too lively mind. I do not like Mrs. Fraser. She is a cold-hearted, vain woman, who has married entirely from convenience, and although evidently unhappy in her marriage, places her disappointment not to faults of judgment or temper, or disproportion of age, but to her being, after all, less affluent than many of her acquaintance, especially than her sister, Lady Stornoway, and is the determined supporter of everything mercenary and ambitious, provided it be only mercenary and ambitious enough. I look upon her intimacy with those two sisters as the greatest misfortune of her life and mine. They have been leading her astray for years. Could she be detached from them? And sometimes I do not despair of it, for the affection appears to me principally on their side. They are very fond of her, but I am sure she does not love them as she loves you. When I think of her great attachment to you, indeed, and the whole of her judicious, upright conduct as a sister, she appears a very different creature, capable of everything noble, and I am ready to blame myself for a too harsh construction of a playful manner. I cannot give her up, Fanny. She is the only woman in the world whom I could ever think of as a wife. If I did not believe that she had some regard for me, of course I should not say this, but I do believe it. I am convinced that she is not without a decided preference. I have no jealousy of any individual. It is the influence of the fashionable world altogether that I am jealous of. It is the habits of wealth that I fear. Her ideas are not higher than her own fortune may warrant, but they are beyond what our incomes united could authorize. There is comfort, however, even here. I could better bear to lose her, because not rich enough, than because of my profession. That would only prove her affection not equal to sacrifices, which in fact I am scarcely justified in asking. And if I am refused, that, I think, will be the honest motive. Her prejudices, I trust, are not so strong as they were. You have my thoughts exactly as they arise, my dear Fanny, Perhaps they are sometimes contradictory, but it will not be a less faithful picture of my mind. Having once begun, it is a pleasure for me to tell you all I feel. I cannot give her up. Connected as we already are, and I hope are to be, to give up Mary Crawford would be to give up the society of some of those most dear to me, to banish myself from the very houses and friends whom, under any other distress, I should turn to for consolation. The loss of Mary I must consider as comprehending the loss of Crawford and of Fanny. Were it a decided thing, an actual refusal, I hope I should know how to bear it, and how to endeavour to weaken her hold on my heart, and in the course of a few years, but I am writing nonsense. Were I refused, I must bear it, and till I am, I can never cease to try for her. This is the truth. The only question is how. What may be the likeliest means? I have sometimes thought of going to London again after Easter, and sometimes resolved on doing nothing till she returns to Mansfield. Even now she speaks with pleasure of being in Mansfield in June, but June is at a great distance, and I believe I shall write to her. I have nearly determined on explaining myself by letter. To be at an early certainty is a material object. My present state is miserably irksome. Considering everything, I think a letter will be decidedly the best method of explanation. I shall be able to write much that I could not say, and shall be giving her time for reflection before she resolves on her answer, and I am less afraid of the result of reflection than of an immediate hasty impulse. I think I am. 
My greatest danger would lie in her consulting Mrs. Fraser, and at a distance unable to help my own cause. A letter exposes to all the evil of consultation, and where the mind is anything short of perfect decision, an adviser may, at an unlucky moment, lead it to do what it may afterwards regret. I must think this matter over a little. This long letter, full of my own concerns alone, will be enough to tire even the friendship of a fanny. The last time I saw Crawford was at Mrs. Fraser's party. I am more and more satisfied with all I see and hear of him. There is not a shadow of wavering. He thoroughly knows his own mind, and acts up to his resolutions, an inestimable quality. I could not see him and my eldest sister in the same room without recollecting what he once told me, and I acknowledge that they did not meet his friends. There was marked coolness on her side. They scarcely spoke. I saw him draw back, surprised, and I was sorry that Mrs. Rushworth should resent any former supposed slight on Miss Bertram. You will wish to hear my opinion of Maria's degree of comfort as a wife. There is no appearance of unhappiness. I hope they get on pretty well together. I dined twice in Wimpole Street, and might have been there oftener, but it is mortifying to be with Rushworth as a brother. Julia seems to enjoy London exceedingly. I had little enjoyment there, but have less here. We are not a lively party. You are very much wanted. I miss you more than I can express. My mother desires her best love, and hopes to hear from you soon. She talks of you almost every hour, and I am sorry to find how many weeks more she is likely to be without you. My father means to fetch you himself, but it will not be till after Easter, when he has business in town. You are happy at Portsmouth, I hope, but this must not be a yearly visit. I want you at home, that I may have your opinion about Thornton Lacey. I have little heart for extensive improvements, till I know that it will ever have a mistress. I think I shall certainly write. It is quite settled that the Grants go to Bath. They leave Mansfield on Monday. I am glad of it. I am not comfortable enough to be fit for anybody, but your aunt seems to feel out of luck that such an article of Mansfield news should fall to my pen instead of hers. Yours ever, my dearest Fanny. I never will, no, I certainly never will wish for a letter again, was Fanny's secret declaration as she finished this. What do they bring but disappointment and sorrow? Not till after Easter. How shall I bear it? And my poor aunt talking of me every hour. Fanny checked the tendency of these thoughts as well as she could, but she was within half a minute of starting the idea that Sir Thomas was quite unkind, both to her aunt and to herself. As for the main subject of the letter, there was nothing in that to soothe irritation. She was almost vexed into displeasure and anger against Edmund. "'There is no good in this delay,' said she. "'Why is it not settled? "'He is blinded, and nothing will open his eyes. "'Nothing can, after having had truths for him so long in vain. "'He will marry her, and be poor and miserable. "'God grant that her influence do not make him cease to be respectable.' "'She looked over the letter again. "'So very fond of me. "'Tis nonsense all. She loves nobody but herself and her brother. Her friends leading her astray for years. She is quite likely to have led them astray. They have all perhaps been corrupting one another, but if they are so much fonder of her than she is of them, she is the less likely to have been hurt, except by their flattery. The only woman in the world whom he could ever think of a wife. I firmly believe it. It is an attachment to govern his whole life. Accepted or refused, his heart is wedded to her forever. The loss of Mary I must consider as uncomprehending the loss of Crawford and Fanny. Edmund, you do not know me. The families would never be connected if he did not connect them. 
Oh, right, right, finish it at once. Let there be an end of this suspense. Fix, commit, condemn yourself. Such sensations, however, were too near akin to resentment to be long guiding Fanny's soliloquies. She was soon more softened and sorrowful. His warm regard, his kind expressions, his confidential treatment touched her strongly. He was only too good to everybody. It was a letter, in short, which she would not but have had for the world, and which could never be valued enough. This was the end of it. Everybody at all addicted to letter-writing, without having much to say, which will include a large proportion of the female world at least, must feel with Lady Bertram that she was out of luck in having such a capital piece of Mansfield news as the certainty of the Grants going to Bath, occur at a time when she could make no advantage of it, and will admit that it must have been very mortifying for her to see it fall to the share of her thankless son, and treat it as concisely as possible at the end of a long letter, instead of having it to spread over the largest part of a page of her own. For though Lady Bertram rather shone in the epistolary line, having early in her marriage, from the want of other employment, and the circumstance of Sir Thomas's being in Parliament, got into the way of making and keeping correspondence, and formed for herself a very creditable, commonplace, amplifying style, so that a very little matter was enough for her. She could not do entirely without any. She must have something to write about, even to her niece, and being so soon to lose all the benefit of Dr. Grant's gouty symptoms and Mrs. Grant's morning calls, it was very hard upon her to be deprived of one of the last epistolary uses she could put them to. There was a rich amends, however, preparing for her. Lady Bertram's hour of good luck came. Within a few days from the receipt of Edmund's letter, Fanny had one from her aunt, beginning thus. My dear Fanny, I take up my pen to communicate some very alarming intelligence, which I make no doubt will give you much concern. This was a great deal better than to have to take up the pen to acquaint her with all the particulars of the Grant's intended journey, for the present intelligence was of a nature to promise occupation for the pen for many days to come, being no less than the dangerous illness of her eldest son, of which they had received notice by express a few hours before. Tom had gone from London with a party of young men to Newmarket, where a neglected fall and a good deal of drinking had brought on a fever, and when the party broke up, being unable to move, had been left by himself at the house of one of these young men to the comforts of sickness and solitude and the attendance only of servants. Instead of being soon well enough to follow his friends, as he had then hoped, his disorder increased considerably, and it was not long before he thought so ill of himself as to be as ready as his physician to have a letter dispatched to Mansfield. This distressing intelligence, as you may suppose, observed her ladyship, after giving the substance of it, has agitated us exceedingly, and we cannot prevent ourselves from being greatly alarmed and apprehensive for the poor invalid, whose state Sir Thomas fears may be very critical, and Edmund kindly proposes attending his brother immediately, but I am happy to add that Sir Thomas will not leave me on this distressing occasion, as it would be too trying for me. We shall greatly miss Edmund in our small circle, but I trust and hope he will find the poor invalid in a less alarming state than might be apprehended, and that he will be able to bring him to Mansfield shortly, which Sir Thomas proposes should be done, and thinks best on every account, and I flatter myself the poor sufferer will soon be able to bear the removal without material inconvenience or injury. As I have little doubt of your feeling for us, my dear Fanny, under these distressing circumstances, I will write again very soon. Fanny's feelings on the occasion were indeed considerably more warm and genuine than her aunt's style of writing. She felt truly for them all. Tom dangerously ill, 
Edmund gone to attend him, and the sadly small party remaining at Mansfield were cares to shut out every other care, or almost every other. She could just find selfishness enough to wonder whether Edmund had written to Miss Crawford before this summons came, but no sentiment dwelt long with her that was not purely affectionate and disinterestedly anxious. Her aunt did not neglect her. She wrote again and again. They were receiving frequent accounts from Edmund, and these accounts were as regularly transmitted to Fanny in the same diffuse style and the same medley of trusts, hopes and fears, all following and producing each other at haphazard. It was a sort of playing at being frightened. The sufferings which Lady Bertram did not see had little power over her fancy, and she wrote very comfortably about agitation and anxiety and poor invalids, till Tom was actually conveyed to Mansfield, and her own eyes had beheld his altered appearance. Then a letter, which she had been previously preparing for Fanny, was finished in a different style, in the language of real feeling and alarm. Then she wrote, as she might have spoken, "'He is just come, my dear Fanny, and is taken upstairs, and I am so shocked to see him that I do not know what to do. I am sure he has been very ill. Poor Tom, I am quite grieved for him, and very much frightened, and so is Sir Thomas, and how glad I should be if you were here to comfort me. But Sir Thomas hopes he will be better to-morrow, and says we must consider his journey. The real solicitude, now awakened in the maternal bosom, was not soon over. Tom's extreme impatience to be removed to Mansfield, and experience those comforts of home and family which had been little thought of in uninterrupted health, had probably induced his being conveyed thither too early, as a return of fever came on, and for a week he was in a more alarming state than ever. They were all very seriously frightened. Lady Bertram wrote her daily terrors to her niece, who might now be said to live upon letters, and pass all her time between suffering from that of to-day and looking forward to to-morrow's. Without any particular affection for her eldest cousin, her tenderness of heart made her feel that she could not spare him, and the purity of her principles added yet a keener solicitude when she considered how little useful, how little self-denying his life had, apparently, been. Susan was her only companion and listener on this, as on more common occasions. Susan was always ready to hear and to sympathise. Nobody else could be interested in so remote an evil as illness in a family above an hundred miles off. Not even Mrs. Price, beyond a brief question or two, if she saw her daughter with a letter in her hand, and now and then the quiet observation of my poor sister Bertram must be in a great deal of trouble. So long divided and so differently situated, the ties of blood were little more than nothing. An attachment, originally as tranquil as their tempers, was now become a mere name. Mrs. Price did quite as much for Lady Bertram as Lady Bertram would have done for Mrs. Price. Three or four Prices might have been swept away, any or all except Fanny and William, and Lady Bertram would have thought little about it, or perhaps might have caught from Mrs. Norris's lips the cant of its being a very happy thing and a great blessing to her poor dear sister Price to have them so well provided for. End of chapter 44 Recorded by Gazina in February 2007「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. » Mansfield Park by Jane Austen Chapter 45 At about the week's end from his return to Mansfield, Tom's immediate danger was over, and he was so far pronounced safe as to make his mother perfectly easy for being now used to the sight of him in his suffering helpless state, and hearing only the best, and never thinking beyond what she heard, 
with no disposition for alarm, and no aptitude at a hint, Lady Bertram was the happiest subject in the world for a little medical imposition. The fever was subdued. The fever had been his complaint. Of course he would soon be well again. Lady Bertram could think nothing less, and Fanny shared her aunt's security, till she received a few lines from Edmund, written purposely to give her a clearer idea of his brother's situation, and acquaint her with the apprehensions which he and his father had imbibed from the physician, with respect to some strong hectic symptoms, which seemed to seize the frame on the departure of the fever. They judged it best that Lady Bertram should not be harassed by alarms which, it was to be hoped, would prove unfounded, but there was no reason why Fanny should not know the truth. They were apprehensive for his lungs. A very few lines from Edmund showed her the patient and the sick-room in a juster and stronger light than all Lady Bertram's sheets of paper could do. There was hardly any one in the house who might not have described, from personal observation, better than herself, not one who was not more useful at times to her son. She could do nothing but glide in quietly and look at him, but when able to talk or be talked to or read to, Edmund was the companion he preferred. His aunt worried him by her cares, and Sir Thomas knew not how to bring down his conversation or his voice to the level of irritation and feebleness. Edmund was all in all. Fanny would certainly believe him so at least, and must find that her estimation of him was higher than ever when he appeared as the attendant, supporter, cheerer of a suffering brother. There was not only the debility of recent illness to assist, there was also, as she now learnt, nerves much affected, spirits much depressed to calm and raise, and her own imagination added that there must be a mind to be properly guided. The family were not consumptive, and she was more inclined to hope than fear for her cousin, except when she thought of Miss Crawford, but Miss Crawford gave her the idea of being the child of good luck, and to her selfishness and vanity it would be good luck to have Edmund the only son." Even in the sick chamber, the fortunate Mary was not forgotten. Edmund's letter had this postscript. On the subject of my last, I had actually begun a letter when called away by Tom's illness, but I have now changed my mind, and fear to trust the influence of friends. When Tom is better, I shall go. Such was the state of Mansfield, and so it continued with scarcely any change till Easter, a line occasionally added by Edmund to his mother's letter was enough for Fanny's information. Tom's amendment was alarmingly slow. Easter came particularly late this year, as Fanny had most sorrowfully considered on first learning that she had no chance of leading Portsmouth till after it. It came, and she had yet heard nothing of her return, nothing even of the going to London, which was to precede her return. Her aunt often expressed a wish for her, but there was no notice, no message from the uncle on whom all depended. She supposed he could not yet leave his son, but it was a cruel, a terrible delay to her. The end of April was coming on. It would soon be almost three months instead of two, that she had been absent from them all, and that her days had been passing in a state of penance, which she loved them too well to hope they would thoroughly understand and who could say when there might be leisure to think of or fetch her? Her eagerness, her impatience, her longings to be with them, were such as to bring a line or two of Cowper's to Rosidium for ever before her. With what intense desire she wants her home was continually on her tongue, as the truest description of a yearning which she could not suppose any schoolboy's bosom to feel more keenly. When she had been coming to Portsmouth, she had loved to call it her home, had been fond of saying that she was going home. The word had been very dear to her, and so it still was, but it must be applied to Mansfield. That was now the home. Portsmouth was Portsmouth, Mansfield was home. They had been long so arranged in the indulgence of her secret meditations, and nothing was more consolatory to her than to find her aunt using the same language. I cannot but say I much regret your being from home at this distressing time, 
so very trying to my spirits. I trust and hope and sincerely wish you may never be absent from home so long again, were most delightful sentences to her. Still, however, it was her private regale. Delicacy to her parents made her careful not to betray such a preference for her uncle's house. It was always, when I go back into Northamptonshire, or when I return to Mansfield, I shall do so-and-so. For a great while it was so, but at last the longing grew stronger, it overthrew caution, and she found herself talking of what she should do when she went home, before she was aware. She reproached herself, colored, and looked fearfully toward her father and mother. She need not have been uneasy. There was no sign of displeasure, or even of hearing her. They were perfectly free from any jealousy of Mansfield. She was as welcome to wish herself there, as to be there. It was sad to Fanny to lose all the pleasures of spring. She had not known before what pleasures she had to lose in passing March and April in a town. She had not known before how much the beginnings and progress of vegetation had delighted her, what animation both of body and mind she had derived from watching the advance of that season, which cannot, in spite of its capriciousness, be unlovely, and seeing its increasing beauties from the earliest flowers in the warmest divisions of her aunt's garden, to the opening of leaves in her uncle's plantations, and the glory of his woods. To be losing such pleasures was no trifle, to be losing them because she was in the midst of closeness and noise, to have confinement, bad air, bad smells, substituted for liberty, freshness, fragrance, and verdure, was infinitely worse, but even these incitements to regret were feeble, compared with what arose from the conviction of being missed by her best friends, and the longing to be useful to those who were wanting her. Could she have been at home, she might have been of service to every creature in the house. She felt that she must have been of use to all. To all she must have saved some trouble, of head or hand, and were it only in supporting the spirits of her Aunt Bertram, keeping her from the evil of solitude, or the still greater evil of a restless, officious companion, too apt to be heightening danger in order to enhance her own importance, her being there would have been a general good. She loved to fancy how she could have read to her aunt, how she could have talked to her, and tried at once to make her feel the blessing of what was, and prepare her mind for what might be, and how many walks up and down stairs she might have saved her, and how many messages she might have carried. It astonished her that Tom's sisters could be satisfied with remaining in London at such a time, through an illness which had now, under different degrees of danger, lasted several weeks. They might return to Mansfield when they chose. Travelling could be no difficulty to them, and she could not comprehend how both could still keep away. If Mrs. Rushworth could imagine any interfering obligations, Julia was certainly able to quit London whenever she chose. It appeared from one of her aunt's letters that Julia had offered to return if wanted, but this was all. It was evident that she would rather remain where she was. Fanny was disposed to think the influence of London very much at war with all respectable attachments. She saw the proof of it in Miss Crawford, as well as in her cousins. Her attachment to Edmund had been respectable, the most respectable part of her character. Her friendship for herself had at least been blameless. Where was either sentiment now? It was so long since Fanny had had any letter from her, that she had some reason to think lightly of the friendship which had been so dwelt on. It was weeks since she had heard anything of Miss Crawford, or of her other connections in town, except through Mansfield, and she was beginning to suppose that she might never know whether Mr. Crawford had gone into Norfolk again, or not till they met, and might never hear from his sister any more this spring, when the following letter was received to revive old and create some new sensations. Forgive me, my dear Fanny, as soon as you can, for my long silence, and behave as if you could forgive me directly. This is my modest request and expectation, for you are so good that I depend upon being treated better than I deserve, and I write now to beg an immediate answer. I want to know the state of things at Mansfield Park, and you, no doubt, are perfectly able to give it. 
one should be a brute not to feel for the distress they are in and from what i hear poor mr bertram has a bad chance of ultimate recovery i thought little of his illness at first i looked upon him as the sort of person to be made a fuss with and to make a fuss himself in any trifling disorder and was chiefly concerned for those who had to nurse him but now it is confidently asserted that he is really in a decline that the symptoms are most alarming and that part of the family at least are aware of it if it be so i am sure you must be included in that part that discerning part and therefore entreat you to let me know how far i have been rightly informed i need not say how rejoiced i shall be to hear that there has been any mistake but the report is so prevalent that i confess i cannot help trembling to have such a fine young man cut off in the flower of his days is most melancholy poor sir thomas will feel it dreadfully i really am quite agitated on the subject fanny fanny i see you smile and look cunning but upon my honour i never bribed a physician in my life poor young man if he is to die there will be two poor young men less in the world and with a fearless face and bold voice would I say to any one that wealth and consequence could fall into no hands more deserving of them. It was a foolish precipitation last Christmas, but the evil of a few days may be blotted out in part. Varnish and gilding hide many stains. It will be but the loss of the esquire after his name. With real affection, Fanny, like mine, more might be overlooked." write to me by return of post judge of my anxiety and do not trifle with it tell me the real truth as you have it from the fountain-head and now do not trouble yourself to be ashamed of either my feelings or your own believe me they are not only natural they are philanthropic and virtuous i put it to your conscience whether sir edmund would not do more good with all the bertram property than any other possible sir had the grants been at home, I would not have troubled you, but you are now the only one I can apply to for the truth, his sister's not being within my reach. Mrs. R. has been spending the Easter with the Almers at Twickenham, as to be sure you know, and is not yet returned, and Julia is with the cousins who live near Bedford Square, but I forget their name and street. Could I immediately apply to either, however, I should still prefer you— because it strikes me that they have all along been so unwilling to have their own amusements cut up as to shut their eyes to the truth. I suppose Mrs. R.'s Easter holidays will not last much longer. No doubt they are thorough holidays to her. The Elmers are pleasant people, and her husband away, she can have nothing but enjoyment. I give her credit for promoting his going dutifully down to Bath, to fetch his mother. But how will she and the dowager agree in one house? Henry is not at hand, so I have nothing to say from him. Do not you think Edmund would have been in town again long ago, but for this illness? Yours ever, Mary. I had actually began folding my letter when Henry walked in, but he brings no intelligence to prevent my sending it. Mrs. R. knows a decline is apprehended. He saw her this morning. She returns to Wimpole Street today. The old lady is come. Now, do not make yourself uneasy with any queer fancies, because he has been spending a few days at Richmond. He does it every spring. Be assured he cares for nobody but you. At this very moment he is wild to see you, and occupied only in contriving the means for doing so, and for making his pleasure conduce to yours. In proof he repeats, and more eagerly, what he said at Portsmouth, about our conveying you home, and I join him in it with all my soul. Dear Fanny, write directly and tell us to come. It will do us all good. He and I can go to the parsonage, you know, and be no trouble to our friends at Mansfield Park. It would really be gratifying to see them all again, and a little addition of society might be of infinite use to them. And as to yourself, you must feel yourself to be so wanted there that you cannot in conscience, conscientious as you are, keep away, when you have the means of returning. I have not time or patience to give half Henry's messages. Be satisfied that the spirit of each and every one is unalterable affection. Fanny's disgust at the greater part of this letter 
with her extreme reluctance to bring the writer of it and her cousin edmund together would have made her as she felt incapable of judging impartially whether the concluding offer might be accepted or not to herself individually it was most tempting to be finding herself perhaps within three days transported to mansfield was an image of the greatest felicity but it would have been a material drawback to be owing such felicity to persons in whose feelings and conduct at the present moment she saw so much to condemn the sister's feelings the brother's conduct her cold-hearted ambition his thoughtless vanity to have him still the acquaintance the flirt perhaps of mrs rushworth she was mortified she had thought better of him happily however she was not left to weigh and decide between opposite inclinations and doubtful notions of right there was no occasion to determine whether she ought to keep edmund and mary asunder or not she had a rule to apply to which settled everything her awe of her uncle and her dread of taking a liberty with him made it instantly plain to her what she had to do she must absolutely decline the proposal if he wanted he would send for her and even to offer an early return was a presumption which hardly anything would have seemed to justify she thanked miss crawford but gave a decided negative her uncle she understood meant to fetch her and as her cousin's illness had continued so many weeks without her being thought at all necessary she must suppose her return would be unwelcome at present and that she should be felt an encumbrance her representation of her cousin's state at this time was exactly according to her own belief of it and such as she supposed would convey to the sanguine mind of her correspondent the hope of everything she was wishing for edmund would be forgiven for being a clergyman it seemed under certain conditions of wealth and this she suspected was all the conquest of prejudice which he was so ready to congratulate himself upon she had only learnt to think nothing of consequence but money End of chapter 45This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mansfield Park by Jane Austen Chapter 46 As Fanny could not doubt that her answer was conveying a real disappointment, she was rather in expectation, from her knowledge of Miss Crawford's temper, of being urged again and though no second letter arrived for the space of a week, she had still the same feeling when it did come. On receiving it, she could instantly decide on its containing little writing, and was persuaded of its having the air of a letter of haste and business. Its object was unquestionable, and two moments were enough to start the probability of its being merely to give her notice that they should be in Portsmouth that very day, and to throw her into all the agitation of doubting what she ought to do in such a case. If two moments, however, can surround with difficulties, a third can disperse them, and before she had opened the letter, the possibility of Mr. and Miss Crawford's having applied to her uncle and obtained his permission was giving her ease. This was the letter. A most scandalous, ill-natured rumor has just reached me, and I write, dear Fanny, to warn you against giving the least credit to it, should it spread into the country. Depend upon it, there is some mistake, and that a day or two will clear it up, at any rate that Henry is blameless, and in spite of a moment's étroiderie, thinks of nobody but you. Say not a word of it, hear nothing, surmise nothing, whisper nothing, till I write again. I am sure it will be all hushed up, and nothing proved but Rushworth's folly. If they are gone, I would lay my life they are only gone to Mansfield Park, and Julia with them. But why would not you let us come for you? I wish you may not repent it. Yours, etc. Fanny stood aghast. As no scandalous, ill-natured rumor had reached her, it was impossible for her to understand much of this strange letter she could only perceive that it must relate to Wimple Street and Mr. Crawford, 
and only conjecture that something very imprudent had just occurred in that quarter to draw the notice of the world and to excite her jealousy in miss crawford's apprehension if she heard it miss crawford need not be alarmed for her she was only sorry for the parties concerned and for mansfield if the report should spread so far but she hoped it might not if the rushworths were gone themselves to mansfield as was to be inferred from what miss crawford said it was not likely that anything unpleasant should have preceded them or at least should make any impression as to mr crawford she hoped it might give him a knowledge of his own disposition convince him that he was not capable of being steadily attached to any one woman in the world and shame him from persisting any longer in addressing herself it was very strange she had begun to think he really loved her and to fancy his affection for her something more than common and his sister still said that he cared for nobody else yet there must have been some marked display of attentions to her cousin there must have been some strong indiscretion since her correspondent was not of a sort to regard a slight one very uncomfortable she was and must continue till she heard from miss crawford again it was impossible to banish the letter from her thoughts and she could not relieve herself by speaking of it to any human being miss crawford need not have urged secrecy with so much warmth she might have trusted to her sense of what was due to her cousin the next day came and brought no second letter fanny was disappointed she could still think of little else all the morning but when her father came back in the afternoon with the daily newspaper as usual she was so far from expecting any elucidation through such a channel that the subject was for a moment out of her head she was deep in other musing the remembrance of her first evening in that room of her father and his newspaper came across her no candle was now wanted the sun was yet an hour and a half above the horizon she felt that she had indeed been three months there and the sun's rays falling strongly into the parlor instead of cheering made her still more melancholy for sunshine appeared to her a totally different thing in a town and in the country here its power was only a glare a stifling sickly glare serving but to bring forward stains and dirt that might otherwise have slept there was neither health nor gaiety in sunshine in a town she sat in a blaze of oppressive heat in a cloud of moving dust and her eyes could only wander from the walls marked by her father's head to the table cut and notched by her brothers where stood the tea-board never thoroughly cleaned the cups and saucers wiped in streaks the milk a mixture of motes floating in thin blue and the bread and butter growing every minute more greasy than even rebecca's hands had first produced it her father read his newspaper and her mother lamented over the ragged carpet as usual while the tea was in preparation and wished rebecca would mend it and fanny was first roused by his calling out to her after humphing and considering over a particular paragraph what's the name of your great cousins in town fan a moment's recollection enabled her to say rushworth sir and don't they live in wimpole street yes sir then there's the devil to pay among them that's all there holding out the paper to her much good may such fine relations do you i don't know what sir thomas may think of such matters he may be too much of the courtier and fine gentleman to like his daughter the less but by if she belonged to me i'd give her the rope's end as long as i could stand over her a little flogging for man and woman too would be the best way of preventing such things fanny read to herself that it was with infinite concern the newspaper had to announce to the world a matrimonial fracas in the family of mr r of wimpole street the beautiful mrs r whose name had not long been enrolled in the lists of hymen and who had promised to become so brilliant a leader in the fashionable world having quitted her husband's roof in company with the well-known and captivating mr c the intimate friend and associate of mr r and it was not known even to the editor of the newspaper whither they were gone 
"'It is a mistake, sir,' said Fanny instantly. "'It must be a mistake. It cannot be true. It must mean some other people.' She spoke from the instinctive wish of delaying shame. She spoke with a resolution which sprung from despair, for she spoke what she did not, could not believe herself. It had been the shock of conviction as she read. The truth rushed on her, and how she could have spoken at all, how she could even have breathed, was afterwards matter of wonder to herself. Mr. Price cared too little about the report to make her much answer. It might be all a lie, he acknowledged, but so many fine ladies were going to the devil nowadays that way, that there was no answering for anybody. "'Indeed, I hope it is not true,' said Mrs. Price plaintively. "'It would be so very shocking. "'If I have spoken once to Rebecca about that carpet, "'I am sure I must have spoken at least a dozen times. "'Have not I, Betsy? "'And it would not be ten minutes' work.' "'The horror of a mind like Fanny's, "'as it received the conviction of such guilt, "'and began to take in some part of the misery that must ensue, "'can hardly be described.' At first it was a sort of stupefaction, but every moment was quickening her perception of the horrible evil. She could not doubt, she dared not indulge a hope, of the paragraph being false. Miss Crawford's letter, which she had read so often as to make every line her own, was in frightful conformity with it. Her eager defense of her brother, her hope of it being hushed up, her evident agitation, were all of a piece with something very bad— and if there was a woman of character in existence, who could treat as a trifle this sin of the first magnitude, who would try to gloss it over, and desire to have it unpunished, she could believe Miss Crawford to be the woman. Now she could see her own mistake, as to who were gone, or said to be gone. It was not Mr. and Mrs. Rushworth, it was Mrs. Rushworth and Mr. Crawford." Fanny seemed to herself never to have been shocked before. There was no possibility of rest. The evening passed without a pause of misery. The night was totally sleepless. She passed only from feelings of sickness to shudderings of horror, and from hot fits of fever to cold. The event was so shocking that there were moments even when her heart revolted from it as impossible, when she thought it could not be. A woman married only six months ago, a man professing himself devoted, even engaged to another, that other her near relation, the whole family, both families connected as they were, by tie upon tie, all friends, all intimate together. It was too horrible a confusion of guilt, too gross a complication of evil, for human nature, not in a state of utter barbarism, to be capable of yet her judgment told her it was so. His unsettled affections, wavering with his vanity, Maria's decided attachment, and no sufficient principle on either side, gave it possibility. Miss Crawford's letter stamped it a fact. What would be the consequence? Whom would it not injure? Whose views might it not affect? Whose peace would it not cup up for ever? Miss Crawford herself, Edmund, but it was dangerous, perhaps, to tread such ground. She confined herself, or tried to confine herself, to the simple, indubitable family misery which must envelop all, if it were indeed a matter of certified guilt and public exposure. The mother's sufferings, the father's, there she paused, Julia's, Tom's, Edmund's, there a yet longer pause. They were the two on whom it would fall most horribly, Sir Thomas's parental solicitude and high sense of honor and decorum, Edmund's upright principles, unsuspicious temper, and genuine strength of feeling, made her think it scarcely possible for them to support life and reason under such disgrace, and it appeared to her that, as far as this world alone was concerned, the greatest blessing to every one of kindred with Mrs. Rushworth would be instant annihilation." Nothing happened the next day, or the next, to weaken her terrors. Two posts came in, and brought no refutation, public or private. There was no second letter to explain away the first from Miss Crawford. There was no intelligence from Mansfield, though it was now full time for her to hear again from her aunt. This was an evil omen. 
she had indeed scarcely the shadow of a hope to soothe her mind, and was reduced to so low and wan and trembling a condition as no mother not unkind except Mrs. Price could have overlooked. When the third day did bring the sickening knock, and a letter was again put into her hands, it bore the London postmark and came from Edmund. Dear Fanny, you know our present wretchedness. May God support you under your share. We have been here two days, but there is nothing to be done. They cannot be traced. You may not have heard of the last blow. Julia's elopement. She is gone to Scotland, with Yates. She left London a few hours before we entered it. At any other time this would have been felt dreadfully. Now it seems nothing, yet it is a heavy aggravation. My father is not overpowered. More cannot be hoped. He is still able to think and act, and I write by his desire to propose your returning home. He is anxious to get you there for my mother's sake. I shall be at Portsmouth the morning after you receive this, and I hope to find you ready to set off for Mansfield. My father wishes you to invite Susan to go with you for a few months. Settle it as you like. Say what is proper. I am sure you will feel such an instance of his kindness at such a moment. Do justice to his meaning, however I may confuse it. You may imagine something of my present state. There is no end of the evil let loose upon us. You will see me early by the mail. Yours, etc. Never had Fanny more wanted a cordial. Never had she felt such a one as this letter contained. Tomorrow, to leave Portsmouth tomorrow, she was, she felt she was, in the greatest danger of being exquisitely happy, while so many were miserable. The evil which brought such good to her, she dreaded lest she should learn to be insensible to it, to be going so soon, sent for so kindly, sent for as a comfort, and with leave to take Susan, was altogether such a combination of blessings as set her heart in a glow, and for a time seemed to distance every pain, and make her incapable of suitably sharing the distress even of those whose distress she thought of most. Julia's elopement could affect her comparatively but little. She was amazed and shocked, but it could not occupy her, could not dwell on her mind. She was obliged to call herself to think of it, and acknowledge it to be terrible and grievous, or it was escaping her in the midst of all the agitating, pressing, joyful cares attending this summons to herself. There is nothing like employment, active, indispensable employment, for relieving sorrow. Employment, even melancholy, may dispel melancholy, and her occupations were hopeful. She had so much to do, that not even the horrible story of Mrs. Rushworth, now fixed to the last point of certainty, could affect her as it had done before. She had no time to be miserable. Within twenty-four hours she was hoping to be gone. Her father and mother must be spoken to. Susan prepared. Everything got ready. Business followed business. The day was hardly long enough. The happiness she was imparting, too, happiness very little alloyed by the black communication which must briefly precede it, the joyful consent of her father and mother to Susan's going with her, the general satisfaction with which the going of both seemed regarded, and the ecstasy of Susan herself, was all serving to support her spirits. The affliction of the Bertrams was little felt in the family. Mrs. Price talked of her poor sister for a few minutes, but how to find anything to hold Susan's clothes, because Rebecca took away all the boxes and spoiled them, was much more in her thoughts, and as for Susan— now unexpectedly gratified in the first wish of her heart, and knowing nothing personally of those who had sinned, or of those who were sorrowing, if she could help rejoicing from beginning to end, it was as much as ought to be expected from human virtue at fourteen. As nothing was really left for the decision of Mrs. Price, or the good offices of Rebecca, everything was rationally and duly accomplished, and the girls were ready for the morrow. The advantage of much sleep to prepare them for their journey was impossible. The cousin who was travelling towards them could hardly have less than visited their agitated spirits, 
one all happiness, the other all varying and indescribable perturbation. By eight in the morning Edmund was in the house. The girls heard his entrance from above, and Fanny went down. The idea of immediately seeing him, with the knowledge of what he must be suffering, brought back all her own feelings. He so near her, and in misery. She was ready to sink as she entered the parlour. He was alone, and met her instantly, and found herself pressed to his heart, with only these words just articulate, "'My Fanny, my only sister, my only comfort now.' She could say nothing, nor, for some minutes, could he say more. He turned away to recover himself, and when he spoke again, though his voice still faltered, his manner showed the wish of self-command, and the resolution of avoiding any further allusion. "'Have you breakfasted? When shall you be ready? Does Susan go?' were questions following each other rapidly. His great object was to be off as soon as possible. When Mansfield was considered, time was precious, and the state of his own mind made him find relief only in motion. It was settled that he should order the carriage to the door in half an hour. Fanny answered for having breakfasted, and being quite ready in half an hour. He had already ate, and declined staying for their meal. He would walk round the ramparts, and join them with the carriage. He was gone again, glad to get away, even from Fanny. He looked very ill, evidently suffering under violent emotions, which he was determined to suppress. She knew it must be so, but it was terrible to her. The carriage came, and he entered the house again at the same moment, just in time to spend a few minutes with the family, and be a witness, but that he saw nothing, of the tranquil manner in which the daughters were parted with, and just in time to prevent their sitting down to the breakfast-table, which by dint of much unusual activity was quite and completely ready, as the carriage drove from the door. Fanny's last meal in her father's house was in character with her first. She was dismissed from it as hospitably as she had been welcomed. How her heart swelled with joy and gratitude as she passed the barriers of Portsmouth, and how Susan's face wore its broadest smiles, may be easily conceived. Sitting forwards, however, and screened by her bonnet, those smiles were unseen. The journey was likely to be a silent one. Edmund's deep sighs often reached Fanny. Had he been alone with her, his heart must have opened in spite of every resolution, but Susan's presence drove him quite into himself, and his attempts to talk on indifferent subjects could never be long supported. Fanny watched him with never-failing solicitude, and sometimes catching his eye, received an affectionate smile, which comforted her, but the first day's journey passed without her hearing a word from him on the subjects that were weighing him down. The next morning produced a little more. Just before their setting out from Oxford, while Susan was stationed at a window, in eager observation of the departure of a large family from the inn, the other two were standing by the fire, and Edmund, particularly struck by the alteration in Fanny's looks, and from his ignorance of the daily evils of her father's house, attributing an undue share of the change, attributing all to the recent event, took her hand and said in a low but very expressive tone, "'No wonder you must feel it, you must suffer. How a man who had once loved could desert you!' but yours, your regard, was new compared with, Fanny, think of me. The first division of their journey occupied a long day, and brought them, almost knocked up, to Oxford, but the second was over at a much earlier hour. They were in the environs of Mansfield long before the usual dinner-time, and as they approached the beloved place, the hearts of both sisters sank a little. Fanny began to dread the meeting with her aunts and Tom, under so dreadful a humiliation, and Susan to feel with some anxiety that all her best manners, all her lately acquired knowledge of what was practised here, was on the point of being called into action. Visions of good and ill-breeding, of old vulgarisms and new gentilities, were before her, and she was meditating much upon silver forks, napkins, and finger-glasses. 
Fanny had been everywhere awake to the difference of the country since February, but when they entered the park her perceptions and her pleasures were of the keenest sort. It was three months, full three months, since her quitting it, and the change was from winter to summer. Her eye fell everywhere on lawns and plantations of the freshest green, and the trees, though not fully clothed, were in that delightful state when further beauty is known to be at hand, and when, while much is actually given to the sight, more yet remains for the imagination. Her enjoyment, however, was for herself alone. Edmund could not share it. She looked at him, but he was leaning back, sunk in a deeper gloom than ever, and with eyes closed, as if the view of cheerfulness oppressed him, and the lovely scenes of home must be shut out. It made her melancholy again, and the knowledge of what must be enduring there, invested even the house, modern, airy, and well-situated as it was, with a melancholy aspect. By one of the suffering party within they were expected with such impatience as she had never known before. Fanny had scarcely passed the solemn-looking servants when Lady Bertram came from the drawing-room to meet her, came with no indolent step, and falling on her neck said, Dear Fanny, now I shall be comfortable. End of chapter 46「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. » Mansfield Park by Jane Austen Chapter 47 It had been a miserable party, each of the three believing themselves most miserable. Mrs. Norris, however, as most attached to Maria, was really the greatest sufferer. Maria was her first favorite, the dearest of all. The match had been her own contriving, as she had been wont with such pride of heart to feel and say, and this conclusion of it almost overpowered her. She was an altered creature, quieted, stupefied, indifferent to everything that passed. The being left with her sister and nephew, and all the house under her care, had been an advantage entirely thrown away. She had been unable to direct or dictate, or even fancy herself useful. When really touched by affliction, her active powers had been all benumbed, and neither Lady Bertram nor Tom had received from her the smallest support or attempt at support. She had done no more for them than they had done for each other. They had been all solitary, helpless, and forlorn alike, and now the arrival of the others only established her superiority in wretchedness. Her companions were relieved, but there was no good for her. Edmund was almost as welcome to his brother as Fanny to her aunt, but Mrs. Norris, instead of having comfort from either, was but the more irritated by the sight of the person whom, in the blindness of her anger, she could have charged as the demon of the peace. Had Fanny accepted Mr. Crawford, this could not have happened. Susan, too, was a grievance. She had not spirits to notice her in more than a few repulsive looks, but she felt her as a spy and an intruder, and an indigent niece, and everything most odious. By her other aunt, Susan was received with quiet kindness. Lady Bertram could not give her much time or many words, but she felt her, as Fanny's sister, to have a claim at Mansfield, and was ready to kiss and like her, and Susan was more than satisfied, for she came perfectly aware that nothing but ill-humour was to be expected from Aunt Norris, and was so provided with happiness, so strong in that best of blessings, an escape from many certain evils, that she could have stood against a great deal more indifference than she met with from the others. She was now left a good deal to herself, to get acquainted with the house and grounds as she could, and spent her days very happily in so doing, while those who might otherwise have attended to her were shut up or wholly occupied, each with the person quite dependent on them at this time, for everything like comfort, 
Edmund trying to bury his own feelings in exertions for the relief of his brothers, and Fanny devoted to her Aunt Bertram, returning to every former office with more than former zeal, and thinking she could never do enough for one who seemed so much to want her. To talk over the dreadful business with Fanny, talk and lament, was all Lady Bertram's consolation. To be listened to and borne with, and hear the voice of kindness and sympathy in return, was everything that could be done for her. To be otherwise comforted was out of the question. The case admitted of no comfort. Lady Bertram did not think deeply, but, guided by Sir Thomas, she thought justly on all important points, and she saw, therefore, in all its enormity what had happened, and neither endeavoured herself nor required Fanny to advise her, to think little of guilt and infamy. Her affections were not acute, nor was her mind tenacious. After a time Fanny found it not impossible to direct her thoughts to other subjects, and revive some interest in the usual occupations, but whenever Lady Bertram was fixed on the event, she could see it only in one light, as comprehending the loss of a daughter, and a disgrace never to be wiped off. Fanny learned from her all the particulars which had yet transpired. Her aunt was no very methodical narrator, but with the help of some letters to and from Sir Thomas, and what she already knew herself, and could reasonably combine, she was soon able to understand quite as much as she wished of the circumstances attending the story. Mrs. Rushworth had gone, for the Easter holidays, to Twickenham, with a family whom she had just grown intimate with, a family of lively, agreeable manners, and probably of morals and discretion to suit, for to their house Mr. Crawford had constant access at all times. His having been in the same neighborhood, Fanny already knew. Mr. Rushworth had been gone at this time to Bath, to pass a few days with his mother, and bring her back to town, and Maria was with these friends without any restraint without even Julia, for Julia had removed from Wimpole Street two or three weeks before, on a visit to some relations of Sir Thomas, a removal which her father and mother were now disposed to attribute to some view of convenience on Mr. Yates's account. Very soon after the Rushworths return to Wimpole Street, Sir Thomas had received a letter from an old and most particular friend in London, who, hearing and witnessing a good deal to alarm him in that quarter, wrote to recommend Sir Thomas's coming to London himself, and using his influence with his daughter to put an end to the intimacy which was already exposing her to unpleasant remarks, and evidently making Mr. Rushworth uneasy. Sir Thomas was preparing to act upon this letter, without communicating its contents to any creature at Mansfield, when it was followed by another, sent express, from the same friend, to break to him the almost desperate situation in which affairs then stood with the young people. Mrs. Rushworth had left her husband's house. Mr. Rushworth had been in great anger and distress to him, Mr. Harding, for his advice. Mr. Harding feared there had been, at least, very flagrant indiscretion. The maidservant of Mrs. Rushworth, Sr., threatened alarmingly. He was doing all in his power to quiet everything, with the hope of Mrs. Rushworth's return, but was so much counteracted in Wimpole Street by the influence of Mr. Rushworth's mother that the worst consequences might be apprehended. This dreadful communication could not be kept from the rest of the family. Sir Thomas set off, Edmund would go with him, and the others had been left in a state of wretchedness, inferior only to what followed the receipt of the next letters from London. Everything was by that time public beyond a hope. The servant of Mrs. Rushworth, the mother, had exposure in her power, and supported by her mistress was not to be silenced. The two ladies, even in the short time they had been together, had disagreed, and the bitterness of the elder against her daughter-in-law might perhaps arise almost as much from the personal disrespect with which she had herself been treated as from sensibility for her son." However that might be, she was unmanageable. But had she been less obstinate, or of less weight with her son, who was always guided by the last speaker, by the person who could get hold of and shut him up, 
the case would still have been hopeless, for Mrs. Rushworth did not appear again, and there was every reason to conclude her to be concealed somewhere with Mr. Crawford, who had quitted his uncle's house as for a journey on the very day of her absenting herself. Sir Thomas, however, remained yet a little longer in town, in the hope of discovering and snatching her from further vice, though all was lost on the side of character. His present state Fanny could hardly bear to think of. There was but one of his children who was not at this time a source of misery to him. Tom's complaints had been greatly heightened by the shock of his sister's conduct, and his recovery so much thrown back by it, that even Lady Bertram had been struck by the difference, and all her alarms were regularly sent off to her husband, and Julia's elopement the additional blow which had met him on his arrival in London, though its force had been deadened at the moment, must, she knew, be sorely felt. She saw that it was. His letters expressed how much he deplored it. Under any circumstances it would have been an unwelcome alliance, but to have it so clandestinely formed, and such a period chosen for its completion, placed Julia's feelings in a most unfavorable light, and severely aggravated the folly of her choice. He called it a bad thing, done in the worst manner, and at the worst time, and though Julia was yet as more pardonable than Maria as folly than vice, he could not but regard the step she had taken as opening the worst probabilities of a conclusion hereafter like her sister's. Such was his opinion of the set into which she had thrown herself. Fanny felt for him most acutely. He could have no comfort but in Edmund. Every other child must be racking his heart. His displeasure against herself, she trusted, reasoning differently from Mrs. Norris, would now be done away. She should be justified. Mr. Crawford would have fully acquitted her conduct in refusing him, but this, though most material to herself, would be poor consolation to Sir Thomas. Her uncle's displeasure was terrible to her, but what could her justification or her gratitude and attachment do for him? His stay must be on Edmund alone. She was mistaken, however, in supposing that Edmund gave his father no present pain. It was of a much less poignant nature than what the others excited, but Sir Thomas was considering his happiness as very deeply involved in the offence of his sister and friend, cut off by it, as he must be, from the woman whom he had been pursuing with undoubted attachment and strong probability of success, and who, in everything but this despicable brother, would have been so eligible a connection. He was aware of what Edmund must be suffering on his own behalf. In addition to all the rest, when they were in town, he had seen or conjectured his feelings, and, having reason to think that one interview with Miss Crawford had taken place, from which Edmund derived only increased distress, had been as anxious on that account as on others to get him out of town, and had engaged him in taking Fanny home to her aunt, with a view to his relief and benefit, no less than theirs. Fanny was not in the secret of her uncle's feelings, Sir Thomas not in the secret of Miss Crawford's character. Had he been privy to her conversation with his son, he would not have wished her to belong to him, though her twenty thousand pounds had been forty. That Edmund must be forever divided from Miss Crawford did not admit of a doubt with Fanny, and yet, till she knew that he felt the same, her own conviction was insufficient. She thought he did, but she wanted to be assured of it. If he would now speak to her with the unreserve which had sometimes been too much for her before, it would be most consoling, but that she found was not to be. She seldom saw him, never alone. He probably avoided being alone with her. What was to be inferred? that his judgment submitted to all his own peculiar and bitter share of this family affliction, but that it was too keenly felt to be a subject of the slightest communication. This must be his state. He yielded, but it was with agonies which did not admit of speech. Long, long would it be ere Miss Crawford's name passed his lips again, or she could hope for a renewal of such confidential intercourse as had been. It was long. They reached Mansfield on Thursday, 
and it was not till Sunday evening that Edmund began to talk to her on the subject. Sitting with her on Sunday evening, a wet Sunday evening, the very time of all others when, if a friend is at hand, the heart must be opened, and everything told, no one else in the room except his mother, who, after hearing an affecting sermon, had cried herself to sleep, it was impossible not to speak. And so, with the usual beginnings hardly to be traced as to what came first, and the usual declaration that if she would listen to him for a few minutes, he should be very brief, and certainly never tax her kindness in the same way again, she need not fear a repetition, it would be a subject prohibited entirely. He entered upon the luxury of relating circumstances and sensations of the first interest to himself, to one of whose affectionate sympathy he was quite convinced. How Fanny listened, with what curiosity and concern, what pain and what delight, how the agitation of his voice was watched, and how carefully her own eyes were fixed on any object but himself may be imagined. The opening was alarming. He had seen Miss Crawford. He had been invited to see her. He had received a note from Lady Stornoway, to beg him to call, and regarding it as what was meant to be the last, last interview of friendship, and investing her with all the feelings of shame and wretchedness which Crawford's sister ought to have known, he had gone to her in such a state of mind, so softened, so devoted, as made it for a few moments impossible to Fanny's fears that it should be the last. But as he proceeded in his story, these fears were over. She had met him, he said, with a serious, certainly a serious, even an agitated air, but before he had been able to speak one intelligible sentence, she had introduced the subject in a manner which he owned had shocked him. "'I heard you were in town,' said she. "'I wanted to see you. Let us talk over this sad business. What can equal the folly of our two relations?' I could not answer, but I believe my look spoke. She felt reproved. Sometimes how quick to feel. With a graver look and voice, she then added, I do not mean to defend Henry at your sister's expense. So she began, but how she went on, Fanny, is not fit, is hardly fit to be repeated to you. I cannot recall all her words. I would not dwell upon them if I could. Their substance was great anger at the folly of each. She reprobated her brother's folly in being drawn on by a woman whom he had never cared for, to do what must lose him the woman he adored, but still more the folly of poor Maria in sacrificing such a situation, plunging into such difficulties, under the idea of being really loved by a man who had long ago made his indifference clear. Guess what I must have felt, to hear the woman whom, no harsher name than folly given, so voluntarily, so freely, so coolly to canvass it, no reluctance, no horror, no feminine, shall I say, no modest loathings. This is what the world does. For where, Fanny, shall we find a woman whom nature had so richly endowed? Spoiled, spoiled. After a little reflection he went on with a sort of desperate calmness. I will tell you everything, and then have done for ever. She saw it only as folly, and that folly stamped only by exposure. The want of common discretion, of caution, his going down to Richmond for the whole time of her being at Twickenham, her putting herself in the power of a servant. It was the detection, in short, oh, Fanny, it was the detection, not the offence, which she reprobated. It was the imprudence which had brought things to extremity, and obliged her brother to give up every dearer plan in order to fly with her. He stopped. And what, said Fanny, believing herself required to speak. What could you say? Nothing, nothing to be understood. I was like a man stunned. She went on, began to talk of you. Yes, then she began to talk of you, regretting, as well she might, the loss of such a... There she spoke very rationally, but she has always done justice to you. He has thrown away, said she, such a woman as he will never see again. She would have fixed him. She would have made him happy for ever. My dearest Fanny, I am giving you, I hope, more pleasure than pain by this retrospect of what might have been, but what never can be now. 
you do not wish me to be silent. If you do, give me but a look, a word, and I have done. No look or word was given. Thank God, said he. We were all disposed to wonder, but it seems to have been the merciful appointment of Providence that the heart which knew no guile should not suffer. She spoke of you with high praise and warm affection, yet even here there was alloy, a dash of evil, for in the midst of it she could exclaim, Why would not she have him? It is all her fault. Simple girl, I shall never forgive her. Had she accepted him as she ought, they might now have been on the point of marriage, and Henry would have been too happy and too busy to want any other object. He would have taken no pains to be on terms with Mrs. Rushworth again. It would have all ended in a regular standing flirtation, in yearly meetings at Southerton and Everingham. Could you have believed it possible? But the charm is broken. My eyes are opened. Cruel, said Fanny, quite cruel, at such a moment to give way to gaiety, to speak with lightness, and to you, absolute cruelty. Cruelty, do you call it? We differ there. No, hers is not a cruel nature. I do not consider her as meaning to wound my feelings. The evil lies yet deeper in her total ignorance, unsuspiciousness of there being such feelings, in a perversion of mind which made it natural to her to treat the subject as she did. She was speaking only as she had been used to hear others speak, as she imagined everybody else would speak. Hers are not faults of temper. She would not voluntarily give unnecessary pain to any one, and though I may deceive myself, I cannot but think that for me, for my feelings, she would— Hers are faults of principle, Fanny, of blunted delicacy and a corrupted, vitiated mind. Perhaps it is best for me, since it leaves me so little to regret. Not so, however. Gladly would I submit to all the increased pain of losing her, rather than have to think of her as I do. I told her so. Did you? Yes, when I left her, I told her so. How long were you together? Five and twenty minutes. Well, she went on to say that what remained now to be done was to bring about a marriage between them. She spoke of it, Fanny, with a steadier voice than I can. He was obliged to pause more than once as he continued. We must persuade Henry to marry her, said she, and what with honor and the certainty of having shut himself out forever from Fanny. I do not despair of it. Fanny he must give up. I do not think that even he could now hope to succeed with one of her stamp, and therefore I hope we may find no insuperable difficulty. My influence, which is not small, shall all go that way, and when once married, and properly supported by her own family, people of respectability as they are, she may recover her footing in society to a certain degree. In some circles, we know, she would never be admitted, but with good dinners and large parties there will always be those who will be glad of her acquaintance. And there is undoubtedly more liberality and candor on those points than formerly. What I advise is that your father be quiet. Do not let him injure his own cause by interference. Persuade him to let things take their course. If by any officious exertions of his she is induced to leave Henry's protection, there will be much less chance of his marrying her than if she remains with him. I know how he is likely to be influenced. Let Sir Thomas trust to his honor and compassion, and it may all end well. But if he gets his daughter away, it will be destroying the chief hold. After repeating this, Edmund was so much affected that Fanny, watching him with silent but most tender concern, was almost sorry that the subject had been entered on at all. It was long before he could speak again. At last, now, Fanny, said he, I shall soon have done. I have told you the substance of all that she said. As soon as I could speak, I replied that I had not supposed it possible, coming in such a state of mind into that house as I have done, that anything could occur to make me suffer more, but that she had been inflicting deeper wounds in almost every sentence that though I had, in the course of our acquaintance, been often sensible of some difference in our opinions, on points, too, of some moment, it had not entered my imagination to conceive the difference could be such as she had now proved it, that the manner in which she treated the dreadful crime committed by her brother and my sister, 
with whom lay the greater seduction i pretended not to say but the manner in which she spoke of the crime itself giving it every reproach but the right considering its ill consequences only as they were to be braved or overborne by a defiance of decency and impudence in wrong and last of all and above all recommending to us a compliance a compromise and acquiescence in the continuance of the sin on the chance of a marriage which thinking as i now thought of her brother should rather be prevented than sought all this together most grievously convinced me that i had never understood her before and that as far as related to mind it had been the creature of my own imagination not miss crawford that i had been too apt to dwell on for many months past that perhaps it was best for me i had less to regret in sacrificing a friendship feelings hopes which must at any rate have been torn from me now and yet that i must and would confess that could i have restored her to what she had appeared to me before i would infinitely prefer any increase of the pain of parting for the sake of carrying with me the right of tenderness and esteem this is what i said the purport of it but as you may imagine not spoken so collectedly or methodically as i have repeated it to you she was astonished exceedingly astonished more than astonished i saw her change countenance she turned extremely red i imagined i saw a mixture of many feelings a great though short struggle half a wish of yielding to truths half a sense of shame but habit habit carried it she would have laughed if she could it was a sort of laugh as she answered a pretty good lecture upon my word was it part of your last sermon at this rate you will soon reform everybody at mansfield and thornton lacey and when i hear of you next it may be as a celebrated preacher in some great society of methodists or as a missionary into foreign parts she tried to speak carelessly but she was not so careless as she wanted to appear i only said in reply that from my heart i wished her well and earnestly hoped that she might soon learn to think more justly and not owe the most valuable knowledge we could any of us acquire the knowledge of ourselves and of our duty to the lessons of affliction and immediately left the room i had gone a few steps fanny when i heard the door open behind me mr bertram said she i looked back mr bertram said she with a smile but it was a smile ill suited to the conversation that had passed a saucy playful smile seeming to invite in order to subdue me at least it appeared so to me i resisted it was the impulse of the moment to resist and still walked on i have since sometimes for a moment regretted that i did not go back but i know i was right and such has been the end of our acquaintance and what an acquaintance it has been how have i been deceived equally in brother and sister deceived i thank you for your patience fanny this has been the greatest relief and now we will have done and such was fanny's dependence on his words that for five minutes she thought they had done then however it all came on again or something very like it and nothing less than lady bertram's rousing thoroughly up could really close such a conversation till that happened they continued to talk of miss crawford alone and how she had attached him and how delightful nature had made her and how excellent she would have been had she fallen into good hands earlier fanny now at liberty to speak openly felt more than justified in adding to his knowledge of her real character by some hint of what share his brother's state of health might be supposed to have in her wish for a complete reconciliation this was not an agreeable intimation nature resisted it for a while it would have been a vast deal pleasanter to have had her more disinterested in her attachment but his vanity was not of a strength to fight long against reason he submitted to believe that tom's illness had influenced her only reserving for himself this consoling thought that considering the many counteractions of opposing habits she had certainly been more attached to him than could have been expected and for his sake been more near doing right fanny thought exactly the same and they were also quite agreed in their opinion of the lasting effect the indelible oppression which such a disappointment must make on his mind time would undoubtedly abate somewhat of his sufferings 
but still it was a sort of thing which he never could get entirely the better of, and as to his ever meeting with any other woman who could, it was too impossible to be named but with indignation. Fanny's friendship was all that he had to cling to. End of chapter 47
These were the circumstances and the hopes which gradually brought their alleviation to Sir Thomas, deadening his sense of what was lost, and in part reconciling him to himself. Though the anguish arising from the conviction of his own errors in the education of his daughters was never to be entirely done away. Too late he became aware how unfavorable to the character of any young people must be the totally opposite treatment which Maria and Julia had been always experiencing at home, where the excessive indulgence and flattery of their aunt had been continually contrasted with his own severity. He saw how ill he had judged, in expecting to counteract what was wrong in Mrs. Norris by its reverse in himself, clearly saw that he had but increased the evil, by teaching them to repress their spirits in his presence, so as to make their real disposition unknown to him, and sending them for all their indulgences to a person who had been able to attach them only by the blindness of her affection and the excess of her praise. Here had been grievous mismanagement, but bad as it was, he gradually grew to feel that it had not been the most direful mistake in his plan of education. Something must have been wanting within, or time would have worn away much of its ill effect. He feared that principle, active principle, had been wanting, that they had never been properly taught to govern their inclinations and tempers by that sense of duty which can alone suffice. They had been instructed theoretically in their religion, but never required to bring it into daily practice, to be distinguished for elegance and accomplishments, the authorized object of their youth, could have had no useful influence that way, no moral effect on the mind. He had meant them to be good, but his cares had been directed to the understanding and manners, not the disposition, and of the necessity of self-denial and humility. He feared they had never heard from any lips that could profit them. Bitterly did he deplore a deficiency which now he could scarcely comprehend to have been possible. Wretchedly did he feel that with all the cost and care of an anxious and expensive education, he had brought up daughters without their understanding their first duties, or his being acquainted with their character and temper. The high spirit and strong passions of Mrs. Rushworth especially were made known to him only in their sad result. She was not to be prevailed on to leave Mr. Crawford. She hoped to marry him, and they continued together till she was obliged to be convinced that such hope was vain, and till the disappointment and wretchedness arising from the conviction rendered her temper so bad, and her feelings for him so like hatred, as to make them for a while each other's punishment, and then induce a voluntary separation." She had lived with him to be reproached as the ruin of all his happiness in Fanny, and carried away no better consolation in leaving him than that she had divided them. What can exceed the misery of such a mind in such a situation? Mr. Rushworth had no difficulty in procuring a divorce, and so ended a marriage contracted under such circumstances as to make any better end the effect of good luck not to be reckoned on. She had despised him and loved another, and he had been very much aware that it was so. The indignities of stupidity and the disappointments of selfish passion can excite little pity. His punishment followed his conduct, as did a deeper punishment the deeper guilt of his wife. He was released from the engagement to be mortified and unhappy, till some other pretty girl could attract him into matrimony again, and he might set forward on a second— and it is to be hoped, more prosperous trial of the state. If duped, to be duped at least with good humor and good luck, while she must withdraw with infinitely stronger feelings to a retirement and reproach which could allow no second spring of hope or character. Where she could be placed became a subject of most melancholy and momentous consultation. Mrs. Norris, whose attachment seemed to augment with the demerits of her niece, would have had her received at home, and countenanced by them all. Sir Thomas would not hear of it, and Mrs. Norris's anger against Fanny was so much the greater, from considering her residence there as the motive. She persisted in placing his scruples to her account, though Sir Thomas very solemnly assured her that, 
had there been no young woman in question, had there been no young person of either sex belonging to him, to be endangered by the society or hurt by the character of Mrs. Rushworth, he would never have offered so great an insult to the neighborhood as to expect it to notice her. As a daughter, he hoped a penitent one, she should be protected by him, and secured in every comfort, and supported by every encouragement to do right, which their relative situations admitted, but further than that he could not go. Maria had destroyed her own character, and he would not, by a vain attempt to restore what never could be restored, by affording his sanction to vice, or in seeking to lessen its disgrace, be any wise accessory to introducing such misery in another man's family as he had known himself. It ended in Mrs. Norris's resolving to quit Mansfield and devote herself to her unfortunate Maria, and in an establishment being formed for them in another country, remote and private, where, shut up together with little society, on one side no affection, on the other no judgment, it may be reasonably supposed that their tempers became their mutual punishment. Mrs. Norris's removal from Mansfield was the great supplementary comfort of Sir Thomas's life. His opinion of her had been sinking from the day of his return from Antigua, in every transaction together from that period, in their daily intercourse, in business or in chat, she had been regularly losing ground in his esteem, and convincing him that either time had done her much disservice, or that he had considerably overrated her sense, and wonderfully borne with her manners before. He had felt her as an hourly evil, which was so much the worse, as there seemed no chance of its ceasing but with life. She seemed a part of himself that must be born for ever. To be relieved from her, therefore, was so great a felicity, that had she not left bitter remembrances behind her, there might have been danger of his learning almost to approve the evil which produced such a good. She was regretted by no one at Mansfield. She had never been able to attach even those she loved best, and since Mrs. Rushworth's elopement, her temper had been in a state of such irritation as to make her everywhere tormenting. Not even Fanny had tears for Aunt Norris, not even when she was gone for ever. That Julia escaped better than Maria was owing, in some measure, to a favorable difference of disposition and circumstance, but in a greater to her having been less the darling of that very aunt, less flattered and less spoilt. Her beauty and acquirements had held but a second place. She had been always used to think herself a little inferior to Maria. Her temper was naturally the easiest of the two. Her feelings, though quick, were more controllable, and education had not given her so very hurtful a degree of self-consequence. She had submitted the best to the disappointment in Henry Crawford. After the first bitterness of the conviction of being slighted was over, she had been tolerably soon in a fair way of not thinking of him again, and when the acquaintance was renewed in town, and Mr. Rushworth's house became Crawford's object, she had had the merit of withdrawing herself from it and of choosing that time to pay a visit to her other friends, in order to secure herself from being again too much attracted. This had been her motive in going to her cousin's. Mr. Yates's convenience had had nothing to do with it. She had been allowing his attentions some time, but with very little idea of ever accepting him, and had not her sister's conduct burst forth as it did, and her increased dread of her father and of home on that event— imagining its certain consequence to herself would be greater severity and restraint, made her hastily resolve on avoiding such immediate horrors at all risks. It is probable that Mr. Yates would never have succeeded. She had not eloped with any worse feelings than those of selfish alarm. It had appeared to her the only thing to be done. Maria's guilt had induced Julia's folly. Henry Crawford, ruined by early independence and bad domestic example, indulged in the freaks of a cold-blooded vanity a little too long. Once it had, by an opening undesigned and unmerited, led him into the way of happiness. Could he have been satisfied with the conquest of one amiable woman's affections, could he have found sufficient exultation in overcoming the reluctance, in working himself into the esteem and tenderness of Fanny Price, 
there would have been every probability of success and felicity for him. His affection had already done something. Her influence over him had already given him some influence over her. Would he have deserved more? There can be no doubt that more would have been obtained, especially when that marriage had taken place, which would have given him the assistance of her conscience in subduing her first inclination, and brought them very often together. Would he have persevered and uprightly, Fanny must have been his reward, and a reward very voluntarily bestowed, within a reasonable period, from Edmund's marrying Mary. Had he done as he intended, and as he knew he ought, by going down to Everingham after his return from Portsmouth, he might have been deciding his own happy destiny. But he was pressed to stay for Mrs. Fraser's party. His staying was made of flattering consequence, and he was to meet Mrs. Rushworth there. Curiosity and vanity were both engaged, and the temptation of immediate pleasure was too strong for a mind unused to make any sacrifice to write. He resolved to defer his Norfolk journey, resolved that writing should answer the purpose of it, or that its purpose was unimportant, and stayed. He saw Mrs. Rushworth, was received by her with a coldness which ought to have been repulsive, and have established apparent indifference between them for ever. But he was mortified. He could not bear to be thrown off by the woman whose smiles had been so wholly at his command. He must exert himself to subdue so proud a display of resentment. It was anger on Fanny's account. He must get the better of it, and make Mrs. Rushworth Maria Bertram again in her treatment of himself. In this spirit he began the attack and by animated perseverance had soon re-established the sort of familiar intercourse of gallantry, of flirtation, which bounded his views, but in triumphing over the discretion, which, though beginning in anger, might have saved them both, he had put himself in the power of feelings on her side more strong than he had supposed. She loved him. There was no withdrawing attentions avowedly dear to her. He was entangled by his own vanity, with as little excuse of love as possible, and without the smallest inconstancy of mind toward her cousin. To keep Fanny and the Bertrams from a knowledge of what was passing became his first object. Secrecy could not have been more desirable for Mrs. Rushworth's credit than he felt it for his own. When he returned from Richmond, he would have been glad to see Mrs. Rushworth no more. All that followed was the result of her imprudence, and he went off with her at last— because he could not help it, regretting Fanny even at the moment, but regretting her infinitely more when all the bustle of the intrigue was over, and a very few months had taught him, by the force of contrast, to place a yet higher value on the sweetness of her temper, the purity of her mind, and the excellence of her principles. That punishment, the public punishment of disgrace, should in a just measure attend his share of the offence is, we know, not one of the barriers which society gives to virtue. In this world the penalty is less equal than could be wished, but without presuming to look forward to a juster appointment hereafter, we may fairly consider a man of sense, like Henry Crawford, to be providing for himself no small portion of vexation and regret, vexation that must rise sometimes to self-reproach, and regret to wretchedness, in having so requited hospitality, so injured family peace, so forfeited his best, most estimable, and endeared acquaintance, and so lost the woman whom he had rationally as well as passionately loved. After what had passed to wound and alienate the two families, the continuance of the Bertrams and Grants in such close neighborhood would have been most distressing, but the absence of the latter, for some months purposely lengthened, ended very fortunately in the necessity, or at least the practicability, of a permanent removal. Dr. Grant, through an interest on which he had almost ceased to form hopes, succeeded to a stall in Westminster, which, as affording an occasion for leaving Mansfield, an excuse for residence in London, and an increase of income to answer the expenses of the change, was highly acceptable to those who went and those who stayed. Mrs. Grant, with a temper to love and be loved, must have gone with some regret from the scenes and people she had been used to, 
but the same happiness of disposition must in any place and any society secure her a great deal to enjoy, and she had again a home to offer Mary, and Mary had had enough of her own friends, enough of vanity, ambition, love, and disappointment in the course of the last half-year, to be in need of the true kindness of her sister's heart, and the rational tranquillity of her ways. They lived together, and when Dr. Grant had brought on apoplexy and death by three great institutionary dinners in one week, they still lived together, for Mary, though perfectly resolved against ever attaching herself to a younger brother again, was long in finding among the dashing representatives, or idle heir apparents, who were at the command of her beauty and her twenty thousand pounds, any one who could satisfy the better taste she had acquired at Mansfield, whose characters and manners could authorize a hope of the domestic happiness she had there learned to estimate, or put Edrin Bertram sufficiently out of her head. Edmund had greatly the advantage of her in this respect. He had not to wait and wish with vacant affections for an object worthy to succeed her in them. Scarcely had he done regretting Mary Crawford, and observing to Fanny how impossible it was that he should ever meet with such another woman, before it began to strike him whether a very different kind of woman might not do just as well, or a great deal better, whether Fanny herself were not growing as dear, as important to him, in all her smiles and all her ways, as Mary Crawford had ever been, and whether it might not be possible, a hopeful undertaking to persuade her, that her warm and sisterly regard for him would be foundation enough for wedded love. I purposely abstain from dates on this occasion, that every one may be at liberty to fix their own, aware that the cure of unconquerable passions, and the transfer of unchanging attachments, must vary much as to time in different people. I only entreat everybody to believe that exactly at the time when it was quite natural that it should be so, and not a week earlier, Edmund did cease to care about Miss Crawford, and became as anxious to marry Fanny as Fanny herself could desire. With such a regard for her, indeed, as his had long been, a regard founded on the most endearing claims of innocence and helplessness, and completed by every recommendation of growing worth, what could be more natural than the change? Loving, guiding, protecting her, as he had been doing ever since her being ten years old, her mind in so great a degree formed by his care, and her comfort depending on his kindness, an object to him of such close and peculiar interest, dearer by all his own importance with her than any one else at Mansfield, what was there now to add, but that he should learn to prefer soft light eyes to sparkling dark ones, and being always with her, and always talking confidentially, and his feelings exactly in that favourable state which a recent disappointment gives, those soft light eyes could not be very long in obtaining the preeminence. Having once set out, and felt that he had done so on this road to happiness, there was nothing on the side of prudence to stop him, or make his progress slow. No doubts of her deserving, no fears of opposition of taste, no need of drawing new hopes of happiness from dissimilarity of temper. Her mind, disposition, opinions, and habits wanted no half-concealment, no self-deception on the present, no reliance on future improvement. Even in the midst of this late infatuation, he had acknowledged Fanny's mental superiority. What must be his sense of it now, therefore? She was, of course, only too good for him, but as nobody minds having what is too good for them, he was very steadily earnest in the pursuit of the blessing, and it was not possible that encouragement from her should be long wanting. Timid, anxious, doubting as she was, it was still impossible that such tenderness as hers should not at times hold out the strongest hope of success, though it remained for a later period to tell him the whole delightful and astonishing truth. His happiness in knowing himself to have been so long the beloved of such a heart must have been great enough to warrant any strength of language in which he could clothe it to her or to himself. It must have been a delightful happiness. But there was happiness elsewhere which no description can reach. 
let no one presume to give the feelings of a young woman on receiving the assurance of that affection of which she has scarcely allowed herself to entertain a hope. Their own inclinations ascertained, there were no difficulties behind, no drawback of poverty or parent. It was a match which Sir Thomas's wishes had even forestalled, sick of ambitious and mercenary connections, prizing more and more the sterling good of principle and temper, and chiefly anxious to bind by the strongest securities all that remained to him of domestic felicity, he had pondered with genuine satisfaction on the more than possibility of the two young friends finding their mutual consolation in each other for all that had occurred of disappointment to either, and the joyful consent which met Edmund's application, the high sense of having realized a great acquisition in the promise of Fanny for a daughter, formed just such a contrast with his early opinion on the subject when the poor little girl's coming had been first agitated as time is for ever producing between the plans and decisions of mortals for their own instruction and their neighbor's entertainment fanny was indeed the daughter that he wanted his charitable kindness had been rearing a prime comfort for himself his liberality had a rich repayment and the general goodness of his intentions by her deserved it. He might have made her childhood happier, but it had been an error of judgment only, which had given him the appearance of harshness, and deprived him of her early love, and now, on really knowing each other, their mutual attachment became very strong. After settling her at Thornton Lacey, with every kind attention to her comfort, the object of almost every day was to see her there, or to get her away from it. Selfishly dear as she had long been to Lady Bertram, she could not be parted with willingly by her. No happiness of son or niece could make her wish the marriage, but it was possible to part with her because Susan remained to supply her place. Susan became the stationary niece, delighted to be so, and equally well adapted for it by a readiness of mind and an inclination for usefulness, as Fanny had been by sweetness of temper and strong feelings of gratitude. Susan could never be spared, first as a comfort to Fanny, then as an auxiliary, and last as her substitute. She was established at Mansfield with every appearance of equal permanency. Her more fearless disposition and happier nerves made everything easy to her there. With quickness in understanding the tempers of those she had to deal with, and no natural timidity to restrain any consequent wishes, she was soon welcome and useful to all, and after Fanny's removal succeeded so naturally to her influence over the hourly comfort of her aunt as gradually to become perhaps the most beloved of the two. In her usefulness, in Fanny's excellence, in William's continued good conduct and rising fame, and in the general well-being and success of the other members of the family, all assisting to advance each other, and doing credit to his countenance and aid, Sir Thomas saw repeated, and for ever repeated reason, to rejoice in what he had done for them all, and acknowledging the advantages of early hardship and discipline, and the consciousness of being born to struggle and endure. With so much true merit and true love, and no want of fortune and friends, the happiness of the married cousins, must appear as secure as earthly happiness can be. Equally formed for domestic life and attached to country pleasures, their home was the home of affection and comfort, and to complete the picture of good, the acquisition of Mansfield living by the death of Dr. Grant occurred just after they had been married long enough to begin to want an increase of income and feel their distance from the paternal abode and inconvenience. On that event they returned to Mansfield, and the parsonage there, which, under each of its two former owners, Fanny had never been able to approach but with some painful sensation of restraint or alarm, soon grew as dear to her heart, and as thoroughly perfect in her eyes, as everything else within the view and patronage of Mansfield Park had long been. End of chapter 48 End of Mansfield Park